Good evening. Welcome to the Planning Commission, October 18th, 2017. Uh, roll call, please. Certainly. Commissioner Guerrero. Here. Commissioner Hale is absent. Commissioner Hunter. Here. Commissioner Schmidt. Here. Commissioner White. Here. Vice Chair Bondano. Here. And Chair Radcliffe. Here. Commissioner Sh White will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand while we pledge allegiance to our country and flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, public for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty. Approval of the minutes, we have none. Uh, going on to oral communications, this is if anyone wishes to speak on a subject that is not on the agenda. Okie dokie. Consent calendar, here again we have none. Going into our public hearing, this is a coping session for the environmental impact report for the proposed 1401 Broadway, Broadway Plaza project. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chair Radcliffe and Commissioners. I'm Karen Vaughn, Principal Planner with the City's Planning Division, and we are here for the EIR scoping session for the Broadway Plaza project. Uh, just a brief background, the original application for this project came in in July of 2016, and that was a mixed-use development project on the Broadway block only. Um, in December of 2016, the Sobrato organization, the applicant, held a community outreach meeting. And at that meeting, they first broached the topic with the public of providing um, affordable housing units on an off-site location. In February of 2017, they then amended their application to include the Bay Block parcels, where they're proposing to do some off-site affordable housing. On March 13th, the City Council initiated a general plan amendment for the Bay Block parcels, and that's because those Bay Block parcels currently carry a land use designation of light industrial incubator overlay, which does not allow for any residential uses. And so the applicant, as part of their overall development application, is seeking both a general plan amendment and zoning amendment for those Bay Block parcels. And then on April 7th of this year, just about 10, 11 days ago, we did issue the notice of preparation for the EIR. That kicked off a 30-day comment period that we're in the midst of right now, and the reason why we're here this evening uh, to take in public comment on the scope and content of the EIR. Uh, so just quickly from a project location standpoint, throughout the staff report and throughout the presentation tonight, you'll hear about Broadway Block and Bay Block. Uh, so again, the original application that came in uh, was for the Broadway block. That's the block bounded by Broadway, Chestnut, Bay, and Woodside, except for the Denny's and Jack in the Box restaurant sites. Those are not part of this development application, and those are staying in place. Uh, this development application is subject to the city's affordable housing impact fee, uh, meaning that an applicant could either pay the fee develop affordable units on-site, or they could develop affordable units off-site. And that's where the Bay Block location comes into play. The applicant um, acquired some parcels across Woodside Road, and this is where they're seeking to do the affordable housing off-site in order to satisfy the city's ordinance. So just looking, uh, getting into the site plan a little bit in a, in a little more detail, Again, we've got the Broadway block, which is a mixed-use development proposal with residential, office, retail, both public and private open space, um, underground parking and surface parking. And then across the street, these are the Bay Block parcels. Uh, part of this site is not proposed for any development under, under this application. Uh, that would stay as is. Um, lost my cursor. And then the other parcel is where the affordable housing units uh, are proposed to be developed. And then just to go down into the each block so that we can look a little more uh, in depth. So starting on the Broadway block along the chestnut end of that block, 
you'll see that there are three five-story residential buildings, and these would have about 400 residential dwelling units. These would be market rate residential units. Uh, there's a level of underground parking, and there's a level of above ground parking that is uh, tucked underneath these buildings. Uh, so the buildings do set up on a podium level, and in the interior on that podium level are some private outdoor open space amenities for the tenants. Next, bisecting the block, there's a one and a half acre public open space. Uh, this would be available not only to the residential uh, tenants, the office tenants, but also anybody from the public that wanted to come and utilize this space. And I believe the applicant will be talking a little more this evening in, in their presentation about the programming here. Uh, but currently, uh, it's it's set up where uh, this the top half of it is more of a hardscape terrace uh, area with chairs and tables so that you can eat outside, read a book, whatnot. And then the other portion is a little more landscaped. Uh, currently, uh, the applicant is looking at doing maybe an outdoor fitness center and then a fenced-in dog park. Next to that, we get into the three office buildings. These, again, are three five-story office buildings with a combined total of about 420,000 square feet of office space, two levels of underground parking, and then there is some outdoor area. This would be private open space for the use of the office tenants. And then as we get over toward the wood side into the block, there would be a brand new standalone CVS pharmacy, approximately 15,000 uh, square feet. Up fronting on Broadway, there's another small standalone 3,800 square foot retail building. Uh, and then there's some surface parking that would uh, service these two retail buildings as well as some of the uh, guests and visitors to the offices. So under nearly the entire site from the chestnut end all the way over to the edge of office building C, uh, there's an underground parking structure. And there are three entryways um, off of the street frontages to the underground parking. There's one entry up here off of Broadway under the residential building, another entry off of Bay under the residential building, and then a third entry off of Bay under uh, office building B. There are two entries to the surface parking. One is here off of Bay next to CVS, and the other would be off of Broadway leading into where the office and the retail uses are. And then there's also a fourth entry to the underground parking garage interior to the site, and that would be coming in off the surface parking and going under office building C. We also, up along Broadway, are looking at transit stops. We know that along Broadway, we do have Sam Trans lines. We have the Stanford Marguerite shuttle that will be going back and forth, and then eventually we'll also have the city's uh, Broadway streetcar. Uh, so uh, Jessica Manzi and I, um, Jessica is the city's transportation coordinator, we met with Sam Trans and started to brainstorm where best a transit uh, stop would be on this block and originally we were thinking that either at the beginning or the end of the block would make sense but it turns out that we were completely wrong uh, if we put a stop at the beginning of the block the the bus or the shuttle would have the potential to back traffic up through the intersection so that was determined not to be a good space uh, if you get down toward an end of a block, you're then blocking a right-hand turn lane. And so that's how we ended up with kind of a mid-block uh, space for a transit shelter location. We want to make sure that we don't block the, the view lines through the open space. We think that that's a very important uh, feature to keep. Uh, so we were looking at the location right here in front of Office Building A. And then there would be a corresponding shelter on the other side of Broadway for, for buses going in the opposite direction. We are looking at potentially a mid-block crosswalk here. That's going to be dependent on some of the, the traffic analysis that will be coming forward. 
We certainly want a, a mid-block crosswalk that's going to be safe and e easy to navigate. So that's something that we are looking at. If it turns out that that's not a good location, then uh, the crosswalks down at the corner of Chestnut and Broadway would be the ones that would be utilized. Moving over to the Bay Block, uh, this is it, it's a total of about 4.25 acres, and the applicant would merge the parcels together and then create two developable parcels. The parcel on the corner of Woodside and Bay, uh, again, there's no development that's proposed on this parcel. It would just simply be a, a mapped parcel and stay as is. The parcel on the corner of Bay and Charter is where the, uh, the affordable housing units are proposed, and that would be up to 120 affordable housing units geared at the low and very low affordability ranges, and these would be deed-restricted affordable units. Uh, the the uh, plan over here also includes some surface parking, uh, some parking uh, underneath the podium level, and then there's a courtyard with a community room, and there are some community features on the inside of the building as well. And for this development, the, the one entry and exit would be off of Bay Road, and you can see this uh, entry driveway kind of straddles where that proposed property line would be. And this is meant to be a shared drive so that when this parcel does develop, we will still only have this one entry off of Bay Road. As I mentioned earlier, the City Council uh, just about a month ago initiated the general plan amendment for this project. Uh, you can see here that the Broadway block has a land use designation of mixed use corridor. Uh, that's a very, very flexible land use designation. It, it really allows probably the most types of uses, including residential, office, and retail. Uh, so the Broadway block portion of this project is consistent with the general plan and the zoning. It's when we start looking at the parcels over on the Bay block where the land use designations are light industrial incubator, they don't allow those residential uses, and this is where the general plan amendment and zoning amendments would take place. Uh, so we're only looking at these parcels, and uh, should the project be approved in this manner, uh, these parcels would be rezoned over to mixed-use corridor, and the general plan amendment uh, would m move over to mixed-use corridor as well. I do want to note that when the city council initiated the general plan amendment, that was not any sort of project approval or entitlement. Uh, it was simply the city council giving staff and the applicant the thumbs up to move forward with the analysis. So there have not been any project approvals for this project at this time. Moving into transportation, we know that this is always probably the heaviest part of any environmental analysis. Uh, so staff worked with the traffic consultant on this project to scope out the intersections that we feel need to be analyzed. Uh, there are a total of 10. So we have four of them along Bay Road, along the southern side of the project. We have three along Broadway. One is at Chestnut, one is at Woodside, and then the other, I believe this is Charter. We have the Middlefield and Woodside intersection, the Veterans and Woodside intersection, and then way over off the map a little bit would be the Veterans and Whipple intersection. So those are the 10 intersections that we're currently going to have studied. There are two freeway segments that will be studied. The first from Whipple to Woodside, and then the other is Woodside to Marsh. And then we'll also be studying all of the on and off ramps for the 10184 interchange as it exists now. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to touch on the outreach that we're doing for this project. This is probably one of the larger, if not the largest, development project that's being proposed in the city right now. It's, it's in a, an area that we know is fairly impacted from a traffic standpoint, and it's also at one of our gateways into our city. 
And for these reasons, we felt that we needed to go the extra step and kind of expand our outreach to try to engage the public and, and get some comments and feedback in on this project. So where we typically do a 300-foot radius mailing for public hearings, for every meeting for this project, we're doing a 1,000-foot uh, radius mailing. So all of the parcels that you see highlighted in green on the screen should have all received a uh, meeting notice for tonight, and they'll receive uh, notices for all meetings in the future as well. We also picked up the additional parcels between that radi or that 1,000-foot radius would end and all the way going down Broadway to the downtown boundary. We wanted to pick up these property owners as well because we felt that they may feel some impacts from this project. Uh, we also included uh, the Stambaugh Heller, the Redwood Village, and the Friendly Acres Neighborhood Association chairpersons. Um, we're maintaining an interested party's email list, and I send out uh, periodic status updates for the project as well as all public meeting notices. We've got the project website, which includes all of the project plans, notices, documents, my contact information, and the applicant's contact information. And then we also did the, nose, the newspaper notifications for tonight's meeting as well. So from here, moving into the next steps, uh, we're, we're here tonight to take in comments on the scope and content of the EIR. Uh, but beyond this, we'll be continuing with community outreach. Um, the applicant held one community outreach meeting in December. We're looking at a minimum of two more community outreach meetings. Staff will be moving forward, uh, taking this project to the Complete Streets Advisory Committee and the Architectural Advisory Committees for their review and recommendation. When the draft EIR is published, we'll be back here in front of Planning Commission to take in public comments on that. And then we'll be back yet a third time uh, to get your formal review and recommendation on the final EIR and the project entitlements. And then because this project includes the general plan amendment and zoning amendments, it'll go to council for final action. So council will be the, the final approving authority uh, taking action on the final EIR and the entitlements. So you can see we're, we're still fairly at the beginning stages of this project. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for people to come out and, and be a part and participate in this project moving forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn uh, the, the remaining part of the staff presentation over to Steve Nowak. He's a principal with PlaceWorks, and he's the city's consultant preparing the EIR. So he'll talk a little bit about CEQA and the EIR process. Thank you. Good evening. I will just have a few slides here to talk about CEQA and then uh, <clears throat> complete the scoping meeting. So um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with CEQA. The purpose of preparing an EIR is to inform decision makers and the public of the potential environmental impacts on the document of, on the project. Uh, to engage the public, so the public has an opportunity to participate tonight as well as to review the draft EIR and provide comments before the EIR is brought to you for certification. I brought to the council before certification. EIR is also to disclose potential environmental impacts of the project itself and then to look at ways to avoid or reduce potential impacts. And we, we write an EIR um, using the guidelines of the California Environmental Equality Act, the Appendix G guidelines. They're very specific in terms of the environmental issues that we address. They very really clear, clearly define um, the thresholds we use, and they really uh, make for a fairly concise uh, uh, analysis. Uh, so in terms of where we are right now, uh, we're in the middle of the notice of preparation, uh, the scoping period, 30-day scoping period, which will end on May 8th. We're holding the meeting tonight to receive comments from the commission and the public on topics that should be addressed in the EIR. We'll then prepare the draft EIR and circulate that for a 45-day public review period. Uh, once we receive comments, we'll prepare the final EIR, uh, prepare a robust uh, uh, response to comments document and the final EIR, and then these will come before you in the council for final uh, determination. So um, 
I think we've really covered this. Uh, the, the areas for public involvement, again, the scoping period, the public review period, and then during the public hearings themselves. Uh, uh, when we ask for comments on uh, the scope f as part of the scope tonight, we're uh, asking for your comments on the range of the topics we'll be looking at, any specific issues of concern, any approaches to the analysis, uh, any ideas for potential alternatives, as well as any other environmental considerations. And we ask that um, comments be submitted to Karen at uh, her address that's on, on the screen, as well as email, and we'll, we will be taking verbal comments tonight as well. And I believe we have comment cards as well. So um, that's an, uh, we do urge people to really submit your comments in writing if you can. Tonight, we will be taking oral comments as well. That's it. Great. Any clarifying questions from the commission? Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, being that the council has initiated the general uh, plan amendment, uh, where does that put the planning commission on that on that element? Do we even get involved in that or? Uh, well, the, the city's municipal code allows for a general plan amendment initiation to uh, be done either by the planning commission or the city council. Um, for this particular project, again, because it's a, a fairly large project and because of its prominent location, uh, we didn't want to go through the entire project without the council ever seeing it until the very last step. Mm -hmm. uh, so staff felt that it was better to go to the city council let them uh, kind of, you know, take a look at the project from a, a very broad stance and let them provide the input on the general plan and amendment initiation. So they've, they've already taken that step so that you don't have to. Okay. And the second question I have is, can you just explain how we arrived uh, at the, uh, the Bay Block and not putting the 120 in the actual um, – Development area that we that uh, was being looked at. How did how did how did that arrive? Yep, and I I believe the applicant will be speaking to that um, shortly in in their presentation. Great. White. Thanks, Madam Chair. Would you mind going back to the notification slide? I just had a real quick question on that. I'm sorry to make you go back and forth. It wasn't clear to me the color coding. So, if I interpret it correctly, the dark blue is where notices were sent and the entire blue area represents the friendly acres neighborhood yes okay. that's correct i i have the neighborhood association overlays turned on so this light blue uh is the neighborhood association uh this orange is the standbaugh um i i think this is friendly acres over here and maybe redwood village here it's the dark blue to my eyes. Not it's the, green. The, the notification. Okay, that's all <laughs> yeah, I had to clarify. It's, it's the dark ones that receive the notification. Thank you, Commissioner Bonato. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Vaughn. And so, just to be clear, the applicant currently does own the Bay Block property. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we'll have a presentation by applicant. Good evening, sir. Just like me, can you speak into the <laughs> microphone? Is this better? Good evening, Chair Radcliffe, Vice Chair Bondano, uh, members of the commission. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Um, I want to begin by introducing myself. Um, Peter Tai, representing the Sobrato organization. Um, I also want to thank Karen Vaughn and the rest of the city staff for all their work on this project. Um, I thought I would start off by giving an introduction uh, into Sobrato uh, and who we are and our involvement here in Redwood City uh, to date. Um, the Sobrato organization is a family-owned organization um, located here uh, in Silicon Valley. 
Um, there's three arms of the, of the Sobrado organization. Uh, Sobrado Real Estate, uh, which handles the management uh, and development of all the real estate uh, assets. Sobrado Capital, which handles the non-real estate assets of the family. And then the Sobrado uh, Philanthropies, which is the corporate and family um, uh, giving arm, charitable arm of, of the organization. Sorry. We go back one slide. Um, wanted to point out the mission statement for the Sobrado organization for all three arms um, is up top. It's uh, making the Bay Area a place of opportunity for all. Uh, and, that, and that flows into all three uh, divisions, real estate, capital, as well as the uh, philanthropies. The philanthropy arm is uh, funded 100% uh, from the profits and the sales of the real estate division as well as the capital division. Um, to date, the philanthropic arm has donated uh, $349 million um, to Bay Area uh, charitable uh, foundations. Um, here in Redwood City, um, Sobrata has given $34.5 million. Um, kind of two notable programs that you know Sobrato has pioneered here uh, in Redwood City is the SEAL program. Uh, it stands for Sobrato Early Education Language uh, Model uh, that was pioneered at Hoover Elementary in 2009. What that does is it helps um, bridge the language gap for children from pre-K to third grade who come from non-English speaking households. Um, the, the thought with the family is, and there's research behind this, is Kids, once they get to third grade, if there is a language barrier at that point in time, they tend to fall behind school um, very quickly. And so they implemented this at Hoover. Um, it's done very well. It's won awards from the California State Education Board as well as uh, the California Bilingual um, Board. Uh, it's also been expanded to other schools within California. Uh, the other kind of notable um, uh, involvement here is the nonprofit center um, it's located in Redwood City in Redwood Shores that opened in 2001 it's a 121,000 square foot nonprofit center um, it's about uh, it it basically uh, leases space to nonprofits rent free so Karen already gave you a bit of con uh, a bit of the context here so um, just want to you know, remind everybody the site is at the gateway of uh, Redwood City, um, south of the 101, um, split between Woodside Road and uh, in between Broadway and Bay. As Karen mentioned, the Denny's and the Jack in the Box over in the uh, north northeast corner of our site is not part of it. It's under separate ownership. Um, the CVS is actually part owner of the site. Um, and is also um, involved in the redevelopment. CVS will stay as part of the redevelopment um, uh, in a kind of smaller new store format. Kind of giving a bit of background on the site, you know, this was used as an industrial site uh, in the early 40s all the way through into the 70s. Um, you know, a lot of uh, Cleaning um, products and you know, heavy machinery was used in this area. Uh, as a result, there's contamination on the site. Um, when Sobrato purchased the site, we were fully aware of the environmental contamination that exists on this site, um, as well as the um, kind of failing retail center that existed. Um, we knew that there were leases expiring here at the center, and our vision here was to really create a new gateway into Redwood City um, that would be mixed use um, in nature and uh, provide a, a good entrance into the city. Um, here is a quick look at the uh, current uh, center that exists there. Um, this is the proposed project and so what we're really trying to do is reimagine this gateway into Redwood City. Um, kind of the main organizational um, feature in this uh, project is the 1.5 acre park Karen had mentioned that splits the residential from the office. Um, I'll give a little bit more detail into the programming of that park uh, in a little bit. 
Um, what we really wanted to do was co-locate the office, retail, and residential together and create a, um, a uh, true mixed-use product uh, that would be vibrant both in the daytime and in the evening. Um, one thing that we also try to do um, is have a very thoughtful development and really understanding the issues uh, and concerns of the community. And so, you know, we've been monitoring and listening in to a lot of the concerns of the community. You know, traffic is, is, a, is a big concern. Um, one way we propose, you know, uh, being part of that solution is, um, you know, partnering up with Stanford and uh, having the Marguerite shuttle stop at our site at the bus stop location that Karen had uh, mentioned. Um, the other part is the interchange. You know, we're aware of the 10184, though it is not fully funded. We know that it's a big part of the Redwood City um, future development. Um, so the future development site that you see over at the corner of Woodside and Bay, what we're proposing is to hold that vacant and use that as a staging area in the temporary construction easement um, for the 10184. So we wouldn't develop anything there um, until that project is complete. Um, Another thing that, you know, we also hear from the community is a need for open space, hence the, the main organizational feature being the 1.5-acre park. Um, another topic in the community is affordable housing. And so as we went out to the community and as we, you know, heard uh, different members of the community speak, um, especially at our outreach meeting in December, um, we knew that that was a big, um, that was a big takeaway. And so after that, we started really in earnest and talking with MidPen um, on what we can do over on the Bay Road site and how we can deliver more affordable than what's required. You know, the, the Broadway site would be, you know, about 82 uh, affordable units. We're proposing 120 on the Bay Road site, um, which is, you know, 50 nearly 50 percent more than what's required. Um, I'm going to turn it over to MidPen right now, and they can give a little bit more clarity um, as to the affordable project. Good evening. My name is Jan Lindenthal. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate Development at MidPen Housing. The left side. I just need to go. Oh, there we go. Um, yes, thank you. Um, MidPen Housing is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. We're based here in San Mateo County in Foster City. We've been around 47 years. Um, during that time, we've developed a lot of affordable homes, over 8,000 homes in 100 communities. The majority of those communities are here in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County in the Silicon Valley. About 60% of all of our communities are, are here in the Silicon Valley. We have our own property management company. So we, um, we manage everything that we build, and it's MidPen staff that are um, at the properties um, serving our residents. We also have our own resident services company. So in all of our communities, we're providing on-site services for our residents. In a family community, that's everything from an after-school program for the kids to um, adult education classes for the parents. In our senior communities, it's health and wellness programs and so on. And when we're... Um, really, really committed to that, um, providing those services on site and really understand the importance that that has for our residents and helping them really make permanent changes in their lives. So it goes beyond just getting a roof over the heads, kind of the first start. Um, here in Redwood City, um, we are the developer and owner of City Center Plaza right next door. Um, and that is a property that we developed uh, about 18 years ago and in the last year, did a, a pretty substantial rehab of it. Um, so it's, it's, that's evidence, we think, of our commitment to the long-term sustainability of our communities. We were also proud to be selected by the city to be the developer of the um, Bradford site. And we'll be proposing over 100, and, I believe, 117 senior um, affordable units there on that site with an on-site child care center. So we're very... Um, pleased to be partnering with the city on that project. And then we also are the owner um, of the Redwood Court project as well. Um, to Commissioner Schmidt's question about why is the affordable housing located on the Bay Road site, um, that's a question that we wanted to kind of take head on. Um, the, the short answer is exactly the one that Peter gave, that by aggregating the, 
the housing on one site, we're able to um, provide more affordable homes. Should I continue? Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing that, that Karen mentioned in her presentation is on the Broadway, um, Broadway block site, the parking is located underground, whereas on the Bay Road site, we're, the, we're able to um, develop the housing on a large enough parcel that we don't have to put the parking underground. We have surface parking and some parking in a ground floor podium. Now that saves us, uh, that, to put the parking underground is twice as much as it is to put it in a, in a surface level podium. So it's incredibly more cost effective when we have more land to work with so that we can provide that parking at grade or on an, on an at grade podium. And the more cost efficient we are, the more units we can produce and the faster we can finance the housing. So um, by aggregating the housing on the Bay Road site, we've been able to come up with a cost efficient plan, delivers the most units, and it's, it's essentially a, a project that we can execute you know, virtually um, immediately upon approval of the, of the project. We would be able to immediately go and secure our financing over the counter and proceed with the project. So it enables us to really deliver those units quickly. The other thing that we think is really important is that by um, maximizing the number of units that we can develop on that site, we can also um, make sure that the amenities that we're providing are as robust as possible. So the larger the site that we have to work with, the more um, on-site amenities that we can provide. And typically that is outdoor open space for um, both the adults and the kids, an after-school classroom, a fitness center, um, a computer lab, and a common room. So we're able to provide all of those amenities on site, again, when we have um, the amount of space to work with. It also gives us an opportunity to really serve a wide range of incomes. And given MidPen's track record, as I alluded to earlier, once we've got that really feasible financing plan, then we can go get it done. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that opportunity. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of information as to who we would be serving, and we can, we can talk more about this um, if you wish. But the goal here is to, is to target low-income households in the, in the workforce. There's a huge need, as we all know. Um, and the, the incomes that we would be targeting here would range from about families earning as little as $30,000 up to about $73,000, and that's for a family of four. So quite a wide range of um, incomes that we'd be able to serve. And then our, our focus would be to implement a live work preference. So we would be targeting these units for people who live or work in Redwood City. And so to that end, um, we've done some analysis looking at the commute data. And this is probably information that you've seen before, but it's, it's quite shocking when you, when you look at it. And that is that in, in 2014, 56,000 jobs in Redwood City, 51,000 of those workers lived outside Redwood City. So there's a huge opportunity for us to get people closer to where they're already working and reduce those um, vehicle miles traveled, those trips that are happening today. And of those people that are commuting in, of that 51,000 that are commuting into the city, half of those people earn less than 40,000 a year. So that's telling you that those are prime candidates for affordable housing. The final thing I wanted to mention is, um, as a segue back to Peter, is the design. So we're, we at MidPen are committed to quality design. Hopefully you see that when you look across the, the plaza at City Center Plaza um, and the design that we're developing for the Bradford site. So we're committed to a very high quality project that is, is um, equal to the quality that is being developed on the Broadway block as well. And with that, I'll turn it back to Peter and happy to answer any questions at the end. I'm going to touch on the architecture just a little bit briefly, um, kind of what our intent was here. So this shows the residential, the market rate residential um, along Bay and Chestnut. What we want to do here is activate the streets, um, you know, and so we have stoop units on the first floor. Um, you know, it connects to the Stanball Heller neighborhood right adjacent to it. So it's something we really wanted to embrace. Um, on the office side, what we were looking for is – a extroverted building, um, very glassy. Um, we wanted it to um, be outward uh, facing. Um, and so the, the surface that you see there, you know, uh, the hard surface would be something maybe like a terracotta or something like that, that's something warm, but the majority of the building um, would be glass, um, really kind of connecting it with the inside and the outside. Um, 
And then this is the park uh, that we were talking about, just to kind of give you guys a, a, an idea of what we are envisioning. Um, again, we want to be, you know, we want to have a thoughtful development. And so what we're trying to do here is listen to the public and think about and hear them and about what they want. Um, so if you move from this, the lower portion going upward, you know, you have a dog park that's there. Um, as is currently envisioned, but again, we'll be soliciting um, opinions from the public. But the dog park's about 9,000 square feet that is currently planned. That's about the size of two basketball courts, so it's uh, a lot of space for um, dog and dog owners to congregate and meet together. Um, north of that, you have what we're calling a fitness court. It's very similar to what you see in the blue um, box right next to it. It's you know jump boxes, pull-up bars, something like that to kind of create an active area. Um, and then above that is a connection between the, uh, residential and the office product. Um, above that is really kind of the central plaza area that Karen had mentioned. This is more hardscaped. Um, the size of this is about 26,000 square feet, um, uh, equivalent to the size of the union square plaza area in San Francisco. So it's quite large. We view this as kind of a civic space, um, area where people can congregate, hold, um, some public events. Uh, maybe even have you know food trucks pull up on you know certain days, but really kind of create some vibrancy um, in this area. Um, and so you know, to conclude, you know, I just you know, Karen had mentioned this, but I wanted to to kind of touch upon this also, kind of where we are in the process and kind of what we plan on doing going forward in terms of our outreach. So um, in July of last year, we submitted our application. Uh, December, we had our outreach. Um, I am missing the date of our resubmittal um, after the outreach where we included the Bay Road block. Um, since then, we've had the March 13th um, general plan amendment um, session with city council. We are here at the EIR scoping session currently. Um, starting May 1st, um, one thing that you know, Sobrato plans on doing is twice a month, we're going to have um, what we're calling coffee with Sobrato. Um, the first Monday of every month from, you know, seven to nine, you know, we will be stationed at the site with coffees, bagels, refreshments to let people know in the community, come and talk to us, discuss the project, discuss your thoughts. Uh, in addition to that, the third Thursdays, uh, of every month, we'll be holding it in the evening, understanding that people in the public, um, have work constraints either in the morning or in the evening. Um, we'll be continuing this, um, for the foreseeable future, probably the next, you know, six to 12 months, call it. Um, but, you know, we're making ourselves available to, to listen to everybody because we understand that, you know, community outreach meetings are difficult to attend. Um, you know, people have com prior commitments. Um, so we want to make sure that as long as it's on the calendar, people can kind of plan around it and, and uh, we will make ourselves available to, to listen. Um, in addition to that, we will have um, our second community outreach and then we'll have our third one. Um, and so with that, if you guys have any questions, you know, Jan and I are here to answer. Clarifying questions from the commission. Commissioner Guerrero. Thank you. Um, I have, since we're on the, uh, the slide for community outreach, can you tell me a little bit, um, more about how you plan on, um, letting people know about your coffee with Sobrato or any of your other meetings, um, because when I'm looking, I'm looking at the pictures for the neighborhoods that we sent the flyers out. But I, <laughs> I know that you've done uh, more, I think, than what's required um, as far as the, the sending out the notifications. Um, but I think there's a lot of neighborhoods that are still missing um, in those maps that um, need to be reached out to because they are, you know, going to be feeling the impact of uh, this construction. So, can you tell me a little bit about how you plan on getting out there? Yeah, so in addition to sending out our flyers like we would for our community outreach to the 1,000 square foot radius, um, we're also reaching out to each HOA. Um, and in addition to that, it's going to be on the, um, the city website. Uh, and lastly, I'm working with um, Alex in the planning department, who's really in touch with the you know, strengthening of the HOA um, communication uh, between planning and, and the associations. Um, I'm actually speaking with him tomorrow. He's been out on jury duty, but we want to get that out to all the neighborhoods um, so everyone can know because it's a you know it's a large project in uh, in Redwood City. 
Yeah, and I think that, I mean, I know that there are um, cities working on, you know, the, na the new neighborhood associations and um, revamping them, but I, I don't know, in this case, I do, I, what I've known is that the Stambao neighborhood and maybe, friend, I know Friendly Acres has meetings. I mean, I'm just saying it might be a good idea to go out to those meetings, you know, actually get out there, have people see you, have, because if you have a sign or something that says you're going to do coffee with, with Sobrato, it's hard to get people to go and meet with you. So the more you're out there meeting, you know, going to these neighborhood meetings or, you know, getting out to the key people within that neighborhood that might be able to get information out, you know, to me, that constitute, you know, more outreach, that would be better. Any other, um, okay, I have a question for um, Ms. Lenenthal. Um, just uh, curious about your um, mix on your type of units. I see you're very heavy in the one-bedroom units, which is rather limiting if it's going to be a family project. So talk about why so many one-bedrooms versus a little more two-bedrooms. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've, there's certainly the most demand for the one bedrooms and the two bedrooms. That's where we see the most demand in the, in the market. And of those two, um, it's pretty evenly distributed in terms of where we see the demand. Um, by having more one bedrooms, it does allow us to create more units. And we do see a lot of um, demand from small families, particularly single head of households. So that's, that's the reason, balancing where we see the demand and being able to maximize the number of units. I was just thinking families, I think of, and you made a very good point, single-headed households, and I was thinking dual-headed households with kids. So thank you. That's a great clarification. Um, this is, oh, Commissioner White. So let's open up the public hearing. Please, perfect. Let's open up the public hearing. Motion and a second. All in favor? All right. Opposed? All right. Public hearing. So far, I have one speaker's card. So if anyone would like to speak, ah, more are coming. Um, okay. So I will call your name and the second person. There are three lights on the podium. The green light will be two and a half minutes, then it goes to yellow. When it's red, you're done. Um, we have a couple rules in this chambers. Everyone will be respectful of all speakers. There's a lot of different opinions. And so we want everyone to be very comfortable as they come speak to us. And also I want the speakers to be aware that they are speaking to us and not to staff or the public. So I will start with Steve Witt, followed by Sarah Vinahan. Hi, thank you for taking my comments. Um, I'm a member of the Redwood Village uh, Business Association, and uh, we're just trying to get involved early in this process if we can. Um, as uh, staff has mentioned, um, and in talking with Peter, uh, everyone realizes that traffic is the major concern at the EIC. Uh, uh, the um, we were rather shocked with another project um, that the traffic report was so dated by the time it was being reviewed and then we hired our own traffic uh, uh, analysis to try and find out whether their findings would support what we felt by living there every day and indeed they did um, it was uh, a little bit telling that the other project um, and I'm going to go. I'm going to address this project too. But I just want to kind of give you a little history. Um, always managed to get an LOS of C or better, which means they don't have to do any mitigating factors. Um, and it looked like it was basically they designed the study to meet the parameters. Uh, when we went around went out to hire a traffic uh, engineer company, uh, we couldn't find anyone on the peninsula who had worked for us. Basically, the message we got back was, well, we really like to stay in business over here. Um, if you look at it as a business opportunity for an engineer, you're supposed to hopefully create the results that you're 
customer, the developer, um, is looking for to allow their project to go forward. We're well aware of that. We see that. Um, but we want to make sure that we're not forced out of business. Um, a lot of these companies have been in business for 30 years in Redwood City, uh, support a lot of local uh, people who live here, and it's our livelihood. It's, it supports our families. So um, I would just ask that the particularly the traffic study is done in a very accurate and careful and you know up-to-date manner, manner. And um, Peter mentioned that he would even allow us to talk with the traffic engineer. I got your name right, right? Okay, thank you. I'm kind of bad with names when I talk, get used to it. But uh, long and the short of it is that that is our concern, the, the greatest concern. Also, the, this parcel on the corner of Bay that is not going to be developed, it's going to be used for construction for later Caltrans, whatever. That's a little bit disconcerting because what could that be? How much more of a load could that add uh, in the future? Um, and I said over, overreaching traffic is driven by density, five stories, uh, 10 acres of office space. 10 acres of office floor space. So we might want to look at that too in terms of the density. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Sarah Vinahan followed by Jean Marie Houston. Good evening. I'm Sarah Kinahan. Pardon my handwriting. Uh, and I'm here as a member of the San Mateo County Track. Child Care Partnership Council, which is San Mateo County's planning body for child care and preschool. And we would urge the city of Redwood City to consider inclusion of child care and preschool at this site uh, as a tremendous community benefit, particularly in light of the report that you're going to receive as the next agenda item and the supply gap in the city. And especially, we would encourage the, the city and the developer to look at the environmental impact of attracting working families to this area, both in the market rate and the affordable housing, and uh, the impact in terms of traffic and car travel if they then have to leave the area to find childcare, which would uh, really work against the idea of, of living and working in the same community. Thank you. Jean Marie Houston, Houston. Good evening, Chair Radcliffe, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Jean Marie Houston. I am a employee at the San Mateo County Office of Education. And um, I would like to echo what uh, Sarah Kinahan just said and, and thank you as a uh, city um, and also Midpen Housing and Sobrato for being so proactive and supporting the inclusion of early learning facilities in developments and encourage you to consider um, going a little bit beyond the um, just accommodating, accommodating some after school care um, when we have an opportunity like this and you will hear more about that this evening. Um, it's, it's something that we often miss that opportunity um, in advance. And I want to say as a citizen of San Mateo, I live right next door to the Bay Meadows development and we are constantly kicking ourselves for not having thought about this um, and really included, including childcare in a, a development that is really designed for families, for business and for smart growth and transportation to have early learning facilities in that kind of a setting is just so few and far between. And once the opportunity is gone, it's very hard to, to go backwards and do it, do it when it should have been there to start with. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. That's all my speakers cards. Anyone else? All right. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Public hearing closed. Um, comments from the commission? Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so first off, I wanted to thank Sobratos and the community for, uh, for coming out and uh, having us learn about the process. One of the great things about uh, about being on the Planning Commission, especially with these large projects, that we get the opportunity to let the process move forward and let us learn about the project and, uh, and determine at the end of the day if it's going to be a great project for Redwood City or not. So I appreciate... Uh, the fact that we're starting this very early in the game 
um, and the outreach is going to begin to happen. What I do know about Sobrato is that Sobrato uh, is very similar to Stanford University in regards to outreach. I know you guys are known for uh, really going out of the way uh, and ensuring, especially with these types of large projects, and I know that we're hearing a 1,000-foot radius, but I'm expecting more than that as I know that you guys are probably going to do and try your best to really make sure that uh, the entire community of Redwood City is, is knows about your project. Uh, to Commissioner Guerrero's point, um, that we find creative ways uh, to be able to reach out to that community so you don't get maybe three or four people out to those uh, to those coffee with Sobrato days, but you know that you get a good 10, 15 people uh, on average, if not more, because uh, it is a large project. It's a very large project and a project uh, um, that could potentially have a benefit to the community or not. But, you know, That'll be up to the community uh, to really uh, give you that indication. So I'm hoping that with that outreach uh, that you're able to take in a lot of the uh, information and create that f thoughtful development that you're talking about because um, that's really the only way you're going to really be able to do it. The, only, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the Bay Block project. And when it comes to architecture, uh, and or creating the vision of what it's going to look like. What I would like to see is it's kind of a continuation of that of that of what you're looking at on the Broadway project. If that makes sense, I don't want it where you see this like beautiful, beautiful project on Broadway, and then all of a sudden you have affordable housing that really does not. Uh, how, how do I say it? Does not really. Um, look as great as potentially the Sabra, the one on Broadway does. Does that make sense? So I don't really want to skimp on the, on, on, on the dollars on that project. Um, the other thing is making sure that uh, when reaching out to the community is that we take into consideration um, Redwood City, meaning that the architecture uh, uh, take that into consideration and just say, instead of just saying, okay, well, uh, this square looking building will just fit in perfectly here and you know we'll save a couple of bucks by doing this and doing that uh, this is a project that's going to be on the gateway uh, to Redwood City and it should reflect as such um, so looking for uh, looking for that but I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to this process and learning a lot about your project and uh, everything that you guys are going to come up with uh, not only from the comments from the commission or council, but also especially from the community. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hunter. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, everyone, for the presentations. And uh, Ms. Vaughn, excellent summary and presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a number of things, since this is an EIR scoping session, I have a number of things I'd like to um, have considered in in the EIR or in the uh, whole project analysis. A um, couple of them do relate to traffic, and this is probably the worst traffic area in the city, as I think as we uh, all know. Um, so I would like, when we're doing the traffic studies, I'd like to um, or analyses, I'd like to have some, some different scenarios. One with the scenario of before and another after uh, the uh, proposed um, 101 Woodside Road interchange is completed because we don't know when this project is going to be completed. And um, the interchange, depending on funding, could be, it could, it could be delayed all the way till 2001, 2021 to 2023. So um, I'd, I'd really like to see what the impact of this project could be both before and after that interchange is completed. And you know, using whatever the current design is, I think they've narrowed it down to two, maybe even one to proposed design right now for the interchange project. Um, I'd also like to uh, analyze uh, scenarios with and without the proposed uh, rocket ship project because that's directly um, diagonal across the corner um, from um, the, the bay block. Um, we, that project is still in, in the process. So we don't know what the outcome is going to be of that. So um, I think un unless the rocket ship project is resolved before you do the EIR, in which case you can just go with whatever... Um, the outcome is um, it should probably be, and this should probably be analyzed with and without the uh, rocket ship project. 
Um, oh, one other thing on traffic is um, when you had the intersections that would be studied, um, I think I would want to add spring and charter as we become more knowledgeable about that area, having reviewed the um, rocket ship project, I think spring and charter is a, uh, a, a really busy area in that, um, in that neighborhood. Um, oh, I, I have one question. From watching the, um, the, the city council meeting on this, um, evidently the current zoning is um, with a, an emergency shelter overlay and some of the um, council members had a question about that. Could you explain that a little? It's, it's evidently the state requires some zoning there that, we, that allows an emergency shelter by right. And then what's the impact on that overlay uh, of this project? Yes, there, there was a state law that was enacted that required cities to have areas within their city that were zoned to allow emergency shelters by right. Um, meaning not, you know, needing a conditional use permit or something along those lines, but that the zoning allowed these outright. Uh, so the city did rezone, I, I want to say, a little over 50 acres of land, I believe, uh, with our shelter overlay zone. Um, and these are primarily in uh, the industrial zoning districts. Uh, so the Bay Block parcels do carry that shelter overlay and uh, staff has determined that we're going to carry that shelter overlay forward if, if the rezoning uh, is granted. It would be rezoned to mixed use corridor gateway Broadway with the dash S shelter overlay. So it will stay with that property. Okay, good, thank you. Um, other questions I have really have more to do with the uh, our, our whole housing situation and Obviously, the idea of 120 on-site affordable units is is wonderful, and we all applaud that. You know, the question is going to be what's what's the how's that what's the best way to do all that? Um, so, one thing that I would like to see, and I know this isn't at least I don't think this is typically in an EIR, but um, I'd love to see some some research, like some academic research, on the effects on the community of having mixed income housing all at one place like other projects we've recently looked at, versus having separate market rate or luxury units um, on one block and, um, and all affordable on the other block. Um, we've had some recent projects come before us where the affordable and the market rate units were all mixed seamlessly within, within the, uh, the building, um, and we've all viewed that as a positive thing. So seems like that that would be the preferable way to go, but I really don't know. I don't know what the academic research says on the effect on the community, the effect on the residents. So if um, our analysis could include some some research on that that could give us a an idea of the pros and cons of mixing up the mix the market rate and affordable versus separating, I think that would be very helpful. Um, I would like. Um, Following on uh, Commissioner Schmidt's question earlier, I'd like to one of the alternatives in the analysis to be um, of moving the affordable housing to the Broadway block and then um, moving some of the commercial to the Bay block. Um, that might not require any general plan amendment in that case. Um, and that would, that would kind of uh, follow up to the idea of separating versus integrating um, market rate and, and affordable. Um, I'd like part of the analysis to be what is the impact um, on the neighborhood of um, losing some of the light industrial and incubator uh, area. I know that was a concern in the uh, council meeting of um, a lot of the local business owners. Um, and uh, Mr. Ackman, I think in that meeting, said that they could do some economic studies to see um, the impact on the um, light income businesses and how they can still be successful. So I'd like to see that. Um, and the last thing is if, if, if the report could maybe simply quantify what the impact might be on the jobs housing imbalance, which is one of the big issues in the city. Um, I never quite know in a mixed unit development or mixed use development um, how to quantify that. You know, I have kind of a, uh, an idea in my head of how many workers per square feet of office space, so that would be how many employees are here, 
and then um, you know, how many units. But I'm not really sure whether this would make the affordable, make the job housing imbalance better or worse or about the same. So. Thank you. Commissioner White. Thank you, Madam Chair, and appreciate the presentations from both staff and the applicant today. Um, so this will just reinforce some of the comments I've already heard. Um, traffic, obviously, we know that's going to be a big one. I did have a question for you, Ms. Vaughn. Would the EIR consider um, in the one or two current, I don't know if they're not plans necessarily, but some proposals around the 84-101 interchange, would they, would they factor that in in any of the studies or research, or because it's too far out, we wouldn't really incorporate that as a... Well, as I understand it, and I, I may have to ask Mr. Turner or Mr. Nowak to, to chime in, but the 10184 interchange, uh, we're in the design phase, which is funded, but the construction of the project is not funded. <clears throat> so my understanding is because it's an unfunded project, it wouldn't be analyzed uh, in this EIR. We kind of have to look at that interchange the way it is now in order to set the baseline for the uh, against which the analysis will be compared. Um, and we also can't take advantage of any traffic impact reductions that that interchange would bring about if and when it is constructed. Um, I don't know if... You answered my second question, but okay. maybe Mr. Turner wants to confirm. Yes, uh, I'll confirm uh, what Ms. Vaughn mentioned. And you might recall when we were reviewing the Inner Harbor specific plan, we had a similar kind of um, discussion uh, whereby we knew that 101-84 interchange was a project the city wanted to pursue. Uh, and um, the uh, the sense was that building that interchange and the improvements would improve traffic in the area. But in fact, we could not count on those improvements because the project had not been funded. So I think there's a possibility of actually doing the analysis, but we wouldn't be able to rely upon any benefits that project would bring um, in reducing impacts to uh, a lesser level because the project has not been funded. Thank you. Um, a follow-up onto that. Does that then preclude us um, or the city from um, requiring any mitigations as it relates to, say, specifically 84 that is owned by the state um, or any of those others that may or may not be part of the 84-101 interchange process? And, and should that be considered in this analysis as part of the EIR or any mitigations related specifically to Woodside Road? Does that prevent us from considering that as this, this other thing is coming down the pipeline in the next 10 years or so? I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. It, does it preclude the city from requiring mitigations on... So let me use an example. Um, and I remember a while ago when we had Stanford before us and we had we discussed the Bay Road um, Woodside Interchange and we talked about queuing and the lights, right? And, and I think we had this long discussion about queuing and lights and more traffic. And I remember the applicant at the time said, there's nothing we can do about it because it's controlled by the state. And we've worked really hard, and I believe them at that point. I still believe them. They worked really hard, but there's nothing we can do about it. And it was almost as if what was communicated to me, and I can't speak for the rest of commissioners, was if we were to impose upon a mitigation or requirements or some sort of condition that specifically had to do with queuing or the light timing on, on Woodside Road, we would not be able to, or at least it certainly couldn't have been enforced. So given that this is much closer to the site, Right. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what tools do we have um, in, in trying to mitigate any impacts that we might find as part of the EIR? Right. We certainly could not put any mitigations on that would force a different jurisdiction or a different agency to make changes or, or alter the configuration of like roadways or approaches or, or lights to reduce uh, impacts to a lesser, lesser level. Um, the city could... Uh, 
it, perhaps in the future, if we decide that, say, our traffic impact fee uh, was going to go towards the payment of uh, a future 101-84 project and the city's contribution to that, um, that uh, could the payment of those fees, you know, could be seen, um, you know, as a way to reduce impacts or would contribute to a project that would overall reduce impacts, um, and so the city would be able to do that. But you know, the city could not, you know, require Caltrans in this example to. Okay. Okay, that's sense. helpful. So that's maybe some foundation for some of the follow-up questions I have. <laughs> um, so specific to this scoping study um, or the scoping of the EAR, um, I have had concerns in the past um, when trying to calculate number of employees per commercial square foot. Um, I've seen numbers range anywhere from 250 to 350. I, I think I even saw one analysis at like 400 you know, squ um, square feet per employee. I know I would, I would like us to consider looking at current, you know, um, industry standards. I know for my own business, we go down as low as 125 um, per employee, uh, square feet per employee, which, you know, depending on where you want the numbers to play out, it has an effect on the number of employees that might, a number of, tra and of trips. So, so I don't know what that number ought to be, but it should be based on some standards that are unique to the Bay Area, because I think we've usually used nationwide study numbers and the Bay Area, I think, is unique specifically Silicon Valley. So that's one comment um, I had. Um, I do agree with uh, Commissioner Schmidt and Commissioner Hunter regarding expanding the notification. Um, that's why I kind of asked it in previously, because we do have, I think, a sensitive residential neighborhood there um, in at Heller Stambaugh, and I'd love for it to be more carried through. And, um, uh, the uh, the neighborhood there, and I would even suggest whatever traffic intersections that we look at, that we look at those areas. If they're important enough for us to consider studying the traffic, I think it's important enough for us to consider notifying the neighbors in those areas. So I think that might be a good way of maybe extending it both vertically and horizontally. So I appreciate that. Um, I would like to con to make sure we study um, the pedestrian crossings of Woodside Road. Um, if it is intended that these are going to be family, I heard no word family a couple times tonight, um, uh, trying to cross to Hoover Park and school, since that would likely be the school for these two areas, as, as well as the public park. Um, I want to make sure that we, I don't think there's any safe way unless you're going to go all the way down Chestnut to Stambaugh, take the overcrossing, walk back up. I don't think anyone would do that. So I'd like for us to study that, which then goes into the mitigation around Wood, Woodside, or Woodside Road that I talked about. So looking at that, specifically with park and school access, um, there, you know, probably Bay and Woodside would be an area to look at. Um, we don't obviously have enough analysis. I know this is not looking at the actual plan, um, but looking at any, what I'll call active open space, um, what we saw, at least initially presented to us tonight, was what I would call passive open space, um, but act, active open space where kids can play on a playground. I think there would, I think the exercise would probably qualify as active, but again, if there's families um, and there really isn't a safe, currently a safe way of walking to an active park that I think would accommodate families, I'd, I'd like to explore that on site, whether it's on um, in both locations. Uh, what was the other one I had here? I apologize. In looking to ex our traffic intersections, I would recommend that we extend it a little bit further than we have. Um, I know if I were driving here and I know that the Woodside 101 is not going to be resolved for the next 10 years, um, I would probably look, I would probably personally drive Marsh, right? And I would either take Marsh to Roslyn um, to Bay or I would take Marsh, Florence to Bay um, and probably somewhere take you know, Fifth Avenue or Third Avenue through that residential neighborhood. So I just kind of outlined what I think are going to be changes in traffic patterns. I think that's going to happen anyway because of Stanford, and then um, this will just add that. So I would recommend that we extend our intersections, you know, from Bay and Second. I think that'll, or maybe all the way Bay and Marsh, somewhere around there. Um, um, and last, sorry to capitalize all the time here, um, I am interested to understand if there's any economic impacts in a loss of light industrial um, or incubator space in the city. That was a, con was a concern that we heard in previous meetings. Um, this entire area at one point had more of a 
light industrial incubator kind of feel, and now it's becoming more of an office park um, that does butt up against some residential. So that is, I don't know if that's something we can do, but I, I do know the city council commented on that. I, I, I share that same concern. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Guerrero. Thank you. Um, let's see. I do have some uh, questions. Well, just one quick question and then some comments. Um, can can you tell me again what the size of the park, the active and that part of it? And then I wanted to um, kind of compare the dog park to the one in Redwood Shores. I don't remember the size of the one in Redwood Shores, but um, I kind of wanted to get an idea of what um, this, how this park compares to that. Well, the, the public open space area is about 1.56 acres currently. Uh, I know that we have... The Redwood that. Shores one? Okay. Okay. Okay, so it's it's pretty comparable to the one in, in Redwood Shores. The dog park. Okay. Okay. Um, so to me, um, you know, this, this project has a lot of um, interesting potential, and I do look forward to finding you know, what's gonna come out in the uh, environmental impact report. Um, I think the the one thing that to me, um, there's a lot of um, neighbors, um, there's a big community in Stambau, that a lot of families and a lot of children. So I'd like to see if there's a way to create more, like uh, Commissioner White mentioned, a lot more um, active open space for, for, ch for students. Um, so that's that's just the that part of it. Um, the big part for me um, is the retail and the loss of uh, retail, and and I'm not talking about big retail with large retail brands. I, I mean, some of them are closing. Amazon's you know taking up the market, but what I'm talking about is neighborhood serving retail. So I'd like to see if there's a way. Um, to do some kind of uh, inventory as to the retail stores that are with, within that area, maybe half a mile from the site or a mile from the site, I don't know what's appropriate, um, some kind of assessments on the potentials of um, you know, what, the, what this neighborhood would need. So that's part of it. Um, and then maybe also like a conceptual retail leasing plan from Sobrato for um, retail space that they would build. So that's, um, you know, to me, that's part of what um, is going to be needed. Um, I do see the loss of Foodsco um, and some of the stores along, I mean, CBS will be there. Um, you know, I talked about the, um, the there's a, there was a store there where you were able to buy boots. <laughs> I worked on a couple construction sites, and I had to go buy my boots there. Um, and just you know, little little uh, restaurants and other stores that were there. That you know, I, I think we need to kind of um, see if that we can put together a study as to what would be needed for that area. Um, so that would be something um, that I would want analyzed. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, the um, some kind of daycare. Um, and I'd like to further um, see how we can, as planning commissioners, um, find a way to um, to encourage, you know, to encourage these developments and to encourage the uh, employers to create some kind of fund or something where we would be able to uh, create the afford affordable daycare for for employees. Um, you know, to me, that's very important. I don't. I want to make sure that we take this opportunity to to study that, to find a way, um, work together. You know, partner up and work together and see if we can find a way. Um, there is such a big need, and uh, we do have the presentation coming up. And I've I've been reading that, but you know, I have family that has kids, and they take them to family members. So there's there's a big need for that as well. So that's something that I'd like to. Um, have studied. And then, um, of course, the community outreach, you know, as I said, needs to be expanded. Um, I'd like to get um, information on the contamination 
um, make sure that all the reports are in there and that uh, the, if there's any letters from any of the agencies or any results, I'm sure that will be in there, but I want to make sure that, that those are part of it as well. Um, the, sorry, I made a whole bunch of notes. Um, I think that's it. Um, I think we mentioned the um, expanding the intersections to be studied. And, you know, I'm kind of concerned about the traffic the way it is now and the entrance entrances coming in from Broadway. And, you know, there's a certain times when it's really difficult. It takes a long time to get through. So um, that's something that uh, is really important. Oh, and then um, the last thing, I guess, would be, because this is a gateway into our community, I'd like to see some kind of sign. I mean, this is probably too early for this, but um, something, some kind of welcoming sign. I think um, Kaiser did one, and I'm not sure the location, but I, as I was driving by, I, I, I saw it, and I thought that was really cool what they did. So, you know, something that, some kind of welcoming sign, um, because it is, you know, you are entering Redwood City, and this is a project that's um, going to be, you know, in that location. Um, and then just the last thing, I, you know, I, I think with the number of units um, that are, I mean, I kind of understand why uh, the number of units, the 120 units of affordable housing um, would be on that, um, that side on the Bay Block, but I still think... Um, you know, if there's some way of integrating some of the um, affordable units into the Broadway block, to me, some kind of analysis to see if, if that can happen. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Bondano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Vaughn, can you um, refresh my memory? When you were talking about the underground parking for the Broadway block, it sounded as if the essentially was like if at least three quarters of that entire block would have the underground parking. Could you just re remind me the boundaries, uh, what would be underneath this? Yes. So uh, all the way from, from the edge of Chestnut, uh, all the way over to the edge of Office Building C. So there would be underground parking underneath this whole section of the project effectively underneath every building except for the cvs on the on the corner and then the surface parking yes and is that uh is the is the idea that that's completely open so would that serve both the residential and the office space all together how, how is that potentially going to it, it would the proposal look. by the applicant is a shared underground parking facility you know, with the thought being that residents uh, leave during the day, freeing up a lot of uh, parking spaces and the office workers come in during the day. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently the office workers leave at night and the residents come home. So we're, we're hoping that there are some people that live and work on the site. Yeah. Um, but as opposed to fully parking the residential and fully parking the office, this would be kind of a, an integrated shared underground parking facility. Uh, each one of the residents would have at least one uh, assigned space, so each unit would have a space, but there would be uh, kind of a grouping of spaces that would be shared spaces between the uses. Okay, good. I, I appreciate that. I was hoping that was the answer. Um, if the answer was uh, the opposite, which would have been, here's the distinct office parking, here's the residential parking, and the two shall never cross, my ask would have been, in studying the CEQA parking issues if it an alternative would be to sort of open it up and make it um less restrictive i guess if the, you know or, or such a hard and fast line between the two uses so that's encouraging i guess i don't need to ask for that as an alternative since that's the the, the proposal um i'll just go a lot of been uh, a lot of comments already been made that i will uh, agree with my colleagues at the moment so i'll just i'll go on the record and a, a plus one for all of the expanded intersections to be studied um, with the traffic. So I will agree with, you know, all of the other intersections that have been mentioned. Um, 
and alternatives. So in our report, clearly we have the project under SQL. We'll always have the 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 non project, the no project alternative. Um, is staff any is staff have any idea or or um, suggestions on other alternatives uh, at this moment, or are you all looking f precisely from just the input that you're getting tonight and and written comments? Well, the. Uh you know, the, the preparation of all of the technical reports and then the preparation of the draft EIR will kind of flush out what some of the alternatives are that will need to be looked at because the SQL alternatives are meant to identify ways of reducing any identified impacts. So some of those will come along throughout the process. Uh, we are going to structure the EIR in a way that, let me see if I can go back one. Here we go. Uh, you know, on the Bay Block site, we do know that it requires a general plan amendment, a zoning amendment, there's site contamination, and there's currently a, a, a restriction, I believe, by the EPA on that site to not allow residential uses because of the site contamination. Uh, the applicant is currently working with the EPA, and of course, everybody would love to see the site cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing that there are that, that there may be some uh, difficulties in getting some of those restrictions removed, getting the contamination cleaned up in time to bring that online with the rest of the project. Uh, so we're looking at potential as an alternative of simply being the Broadway block where the applicant would either pay the affordable housing impact fee or incorporate the affordable units on site and the bay block would kind of drop away. Mm -hmm. So that is one alternative or, or one, uh, it, I don't know if it's necessarily a specific alternative, but we're going to structure the EIR in that manner. It sounds like by somewhat by default that it almost kind of will become an alternative. Yeah. So, but for purposes of, um, uh, Zoning, you know, land use designation, potentially contamination of soils, hazardous materials, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for those reasons, then that should become an alternative. But I also do want to call out very specifically, I'll also do a, I think it's a plus one for Commissioner Hunter and, and Commissioner White. I would like to see an alternative on providing the affordable housing on the Broadway block sort of independent of just the fact that maybe it's a it's a land use or soil contamination kind of a scenario regardless of if it gets cleaned up or not I'd like to see an alternative of of being able to provide the affordable housing what I'm going to call on site in my opinion on site the broadway block not the bay block that's kind of almost like an off site even though that the applicant does own both properties and they are adjacent so I'll do a plus one on on-site affordable housing. And then, I, you know, I guess maybe by default, too, sort of an alternative would be if affordable housing was provided completely off-site, meaning neither one of these blocks. So either providing it in another location off-site or paying the impact fee. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just reminded uh, when Mr. Turner was talking about the 101 interchange um, with Commissioner White, um, what are the, are there a list of community benefits that Sobrato is is offering uh, um, at all for this? I didn't see anything on this. And I, and I just, and I question, and I qu I'm questioning that because um after listening to the Harbor View project on their size and so close also to one interche 101 interchange, um, I guess I thought that was going to be that they were going to help with that or offering up other like parks or some or additional parks or something. Uh, well, they, they'll certainly be um, subject to any transportation impact fees. Uh, that'll be required for this development, and they'll certainly uh, have to contribute to any mitigation measures that their project uh, would necessitate. Um, but as of now, there's no community benefits that are being offered up? For 101.84. For any type of community? I mean, sorry? Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. Do you want to? Commissioner, I mean, Mr. Turner? 
Yeah, I'm, uh, well, uh, as far as I'm aware, and Karen can confirm, we don't have a specific community benefits package. Okay. I mean, you could say that the extra units that are provided above and beyond what they would have to uh, provide for for their housing portion would be considered a community benefit. Uh, early on in this in the stage of this project, uh, no specific community benefits package has been provided to the city. And I think that's kind of the key word is we're kind of early in the process, correct? Great, thank you. Uh, Peter, did, are you? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as everyone mentioned, it's early on in the process. We are, you know, listening to the community and trying to figure out what the most impactful community benefits would be. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have one right now, but we are putting together one. Great. And, um, you know, we, we weren't anticipating that question at the at this stage. <laughs> right. But uh, right. we definitely, the next time we're in front of you, we, you know, we will have something um, more kind of ironed out. So. Great. Thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks. Mr. Mike, I can't see you, that it's on. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one real quick question. We were talking about alternatives. Um, maybe an alternative to consider is, I was just looking at the, uh, and again, we don't have any elevations to really get a visual of what this might look like, but there was something provided tonight in, in, in the presentation. Um, it's not clear to me what the uh, elevation is at the corner of Chestnut and Bay. I presume it's the same five stories probably throughout the whole residential block probably. Um, maybe something to consider because that is kind of kitty corner to a residential area of stepping down there um, closer um, to the residential area, potentially even having the open space broken up into two areas, something that's a little closer to the residential to create a little bit of a, of a buffer or an additional you know, buffer. Um, I'm sure that that would likely necessitate probably moving the residential closer to the office and you're probably hoping to have that buffer between the two and so but just something to consider um uh, as, as a way of stepping down to that residential area and i don't know what is the um heights of the buildings immediately across from um on on bay the other side of bay do you know offhand are they about five four stories or are they lower okay at least four i think aren't they it's a technology park it, it yeah, it's is tech park. it yeah. is yeah, but okay. I, I'm not sure what. Okay, that's is. that's fine. I was just trying to getting a, again getting a, an elevation visual for that, but I think it would be good to at least consider it as an alternative. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay. Any other? Okay, my turn. Um, so first on traffic, looking at our site plan here, we have at least we have three ingress egress on Bay Road. So I'd like to think about traffic leaving coming out, going north on Bay Road, turning either way on Chestnut. I can see turning on Chestnut, going east to Veterans to get onto 101. That could be a potentially different. Um, and then you have potentially them turning west on Chestnut and then up to Middlefield, either going in town or to school, especially school traffic going that way route could be um, interesting. Um, let's see. Of course, we want to look at the child care. We've all said that. Um, as far as alternatives, we'll have the project, as we're seeing it tonight, the project as originally submitted with just the um, Broadway site. And then I'd like to also s study a undetermined site for affordable housing. Um, I don't think that we necessarily have to put the affordable housing on, on the Bay site. I think that we should look at it potentially being in um, a more appropriate location. Madam Chair, would, would that would that be looking at off-site affordable housing in an area that's already zoned for residential uses? Is, Correct. That's okay. more compatible to that type of use. Yes. And then um, also very interested on the effect of our um, light industry zoning because that's a zone that is 
vastly disappearing in other cities and I'm feeling a little protective right now. <laughs> uh, that's everything that I have. So do you have enough information from all of us? Any questions, comments that you would like us to respond to? No, I believe that's uh, excellent feedback. Um, I'm glad that we have our consultants here this evening. They were able to hear it firsthand. We'll be going back and compiling all this together and uh, kicking them off for the preparation of the draft EIR. Perfect. Great. And and just to mention one last time for anybody that didn't want to give public comments tonight, oh. I have uh, comment cards with my uh, address already printed on them in the back. I've got my business cards in the back. Uh, so we do have the comment period open until May 8th if anyone wants to provide comments on the EIR. As well as email. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Right, class staff recommends a couple minute break so we can transition between. Sure. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. Oh, presentation. <laughs> it's got its own.
Have snacks at all? Outside, yeah. Actually, the cookie. <laughs> didn't see the cookie table outside? It's there. They're gone now, but gone. yeah, we, we, we tried that. We tried a cookie. <laughs> That's the clicker. That's the clicker. So back. forward, yeah, and then forward, backward. backward yeah. okay. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Those are great. Okay, so if we could start settling in, we'll re re up. <laughs> Ready? Yep. Okay. So now we will have matters of commission interest, child care supply gap study, and facilities shortage. Yes, thank you. Uh, for this item, I'd like to introduce Kristen Anderson, uh, a familiar face to most folks, uh, but she is the city's child care coordinator and will be introducing the item tonight. Good evening. Um, 
I'm Kristen Anderson, the City Child Care Coordinator, and for many, many years I've been working to help the community of child care and preschool operators to maximize all available affordable and usable spaces uh, for new programs. So over the past many, many years, we've really used up pretty much what is easy to use um, in churches and school spaces. Um, and this facilities shortage has only increased with all the development going on and the rents going on, uh, rent increases going on. So uh, over the past few years, the, the shortage issue has been um, a greater, uh, oh, and become more uh, a, an issue across the county. And in fact, um, last summer, four child care centers and preschools closed in June um, for a total of 256 spaces lost um, because of either rent increases or school districts needing to take their space back. And um, most of those programs looked for up to two years for additional space to to move their programs to and weren't able to find anything. So I was pleased when the county was uh, willing to fund a countywide study of the supply gap um, and to raise the issue of the facilities situation. Um, and so we took the opportunity then to contract, uh, uh, add on to the work that Joanne Brion from Brion Economics was going to do for the county to do additional work for us. So the report that she that is included in your packet um, is what she produced for us and she'll be presenting today. I first met Joanne about 15 years ago when she was working on the child care impact fee study for the city of South San Francisco. Um, her background is in e economic and fiscal analysis, and she works a lot with for cities, developers, and big employers um, on those topics. But the child care analysis has been become a specialty of hers. So I was pleased to have her work on this study. So I'll turn it over to her, and I'll be here to add on. Um. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm really pleased to be here tonight. Joanne Brion with Brion Economics. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I've been working, focusing on child care since I started my own business in 2000. So it's a very uh, dear issue to my heart. I mean, I left my company to start my own firm so I could have more flexibility for my daughter and, you know, just be able to spend more daytime daylight hours with her so that was a <laughs> an interesting thing and then this opportunity came and so basically just a little overview of my approach is to so i'm an urban economist and i generally do ur urban economics i do retail market studies housing studies impact fee studies fiscal financial public financing plans but what i really was realizing is that child care industry is very insular and didn't really understand how development happens and what the development entitlement process was and there was this big gap and so Kristen and other colleagues of ours have been working on this for a really long time trying to integrate the two so that child care is in the normal planning process and it gets considered like parks and schools and roadways and sewer and septic and all of that you know so so that's so what we're the other thing that we started doing way back then was not just looking at the state requires us to look like look at current uh, supply and demand, but we in uh, 2001 for a big study on housing and child care I did for San Mateo County, we started projecting out 10 years so that because these we needed to know what was coming. We, we know we have a shortfall now, but then with growth that's coming, it's just going to get aggravated unless more facilities are provided. So that was another key, different kind, different kind of approach that we introduced back in 2001. So for this study um, tonight, I'm going to be, pardon my cold, 
or go there it is um i'm going to be presenting the summary of the work we did for redwood city and then on the second part of the presentation we're going to just summarize the second phase of the uh, countywide study which has to do with site assessment issues and also potential funding mechanisms so um, before i get into the redwood city analysis I want to point out some uh, differences between the countywide study for Redwood City and the study we did for you specifically. One, that, one difference is that in the countywide study, we're focused on zero to four year olds only, but in the, the city study, we're doing zero to 12. So that's a key difference. Um, the land use data we used for the Redwood City study is very specific to the planning department's estimates of growth expected growth, which is much less than what ABAG projects for the city. So in the countywide city uh, study, we used ABAG numbers for consistency among all cities. So if you're looking at both studies, you'll see some differences. And in the memo we prepared, there's a table right in the beginning that shows those differences. So like population uh, projections are like, 25,000 or more residents higher in the ABAG numbers than in what we used in this study. So I just want to make sure that you're not confused <laughs> about that. Um, so in, in the city's uh, needs assessment, we're following the format and the methodology we use in countywide studies that are mandated by the state. And we're looking at infants, zero to one year olds, preschool, two to four year olds, school age five to 12. We're looking at five year olds now because of the traditional kindergarten uh, programs that are starting. So five year olds used to be in the preschool. Um, we're looking, you're evaluating your existing supplies of 2015. And we're looking at future demand and shortages as of 2015 in a 10 year projection. Um, we're also in this study looking at the number of subsidized spaces currently available relative to the demand for subsidized spaces. And then we're also estimating the demand from employees who work in Redwood City and reside outside of San Mateo County. Um, so the methodology here is, I won't get into the gory details of it, but um, it's basically looking, taking census data, the number of children by age group, looking at labor force participation rates by type of families, and then making some estimates. We're always adjusting for families who choose non-licensed care, like nannies, family members, other unlicensed care. So we never uh, expect 100% of all children to need a licensed care space. So we, we start with total children and then we work down um, currently in the city, we have 111 family child care home providers, and that's a very important part of the supply of child care in all cities, and it's more affordable generally. And then we have 46 center-based programs in the city currently. So this is a chart that shows the supply by infants, preschool, and school age, and um, the family child care uh, homes are a large supply of infant care, and it's kind of equal to uh, you know, um, the licensed center for infants uh, equal. And then when you get into preschool and school age, those two types of care are much more concentrated in the center-based programs. Um, currently, there's about almost 15,000 children, zero to 12 in 2015, and there's a demand for about 78 hundred licensed child care spaces in total for those zero to 12 year olds. Um, so about half of all children are expected to need some kind of licensed uh, space. Breaking that down, almost a thousand infants, about 3,100 preschoolers and 3,700 school age. We have currently in the city about 1,100, a shortage of 1,100 spaces in total. Uh, and then, uh, we like to express this as, you know, what percent of current demand is met by current supply. So 86% of the current demand in the city is met by the current supply. Um, and then the employee demand is a little uh, tricky 
um, we're focusing here on employees that are commuting into the city from outside the city and outside the county. Um, and so there's about 57,000 employees right now that work in the city. It's expected to grow to 71,000. So quite a big increase, 24% increase. 40%, for our numbers are 48%. I think the prior speaker mentioned something similar uh, of workers reside outside the county. Now, particularly with the bay in between where a lot of these people live, uh, a lot of parents don't want to have their children across the bay and whatnot and may choose to bring their child to work and have them want daycare, especially the younger age children close by. And we're using a 3% uh, demand factor of these employees would require one child care space. And so that's a conservative assumption. It could be as high as 15%, depending on the business and type of employer. So the demand that we estimate for the city is 331 infant spaces and 496 preschool spaces from this employee demand. So this is a chart that just summarizes the supply and demand uh, by type of care, infant, preschool, and school age, and then shows the shortages. So in this case, we have a shortage in all three categories. Often in some cities, we'll have a slight surplus in preschool because the market is more, uh, it's, it, it, the business model for preschool works better and is more, you know, there's just, it's a better, they're better able to survive and to exist and bring in enough money to cover their expenses. So preschool is always often the best provided type of care of those three. But in this case, we still have shortfalls, 225 infant care spaces, 522 uh, preschool and got new glasses. So it's like, Four, almost 400 school age uh, spaces for the total of 1,105. So um, in terms of subsidized care, about 25% of the children in, in Redwood City, zero to 12, qualify for subsidized care, but um, there is not nearly enough um, subsidized spaces specifically for infant care. And that's partly um, because just in general, the market doesn't provide a lot of infant care because it's more costly, has a higher student to, I mean, teacher to child ratio. Um, and then so 7% of current demand is met for infants in subsidized spaces, 86% for preschool and 55% for school age. So um, Overall, this graph just gives you an illustration of those numbers that I just read off. So um, in uh, the next 10 years, we're going to have a bit of growth. We're going to see about 5,500 more residents in 10 years, and children 0 to 12 is estimated increased by almost 1,000. So we'll have, a, without any new supply added, we'll have a, a higher shortfall of almost 1,800 spaces or only roughly 79% of demand would be met if no new supply is provided. And then these, this next chart just summarizes the future uh, supply and demand analysis at 2025. So what I want to what we wanted to do here was just give you an overview of the presentation, we, the phase two of the countywide study that we just made to the first five, uh, a much shorter version of it. Um, so this study was um, conceived of a countywide needs assessment, also at the city level. And then we did two major um, this is phase one. We did two major surveys, one of providers all across the county. And then we did what was a new sort of survey that I had never done before, but it was called a stakeholder survey. And so we surveyed almost seven or 800 stakeholders um, that we identified through an, a whole detailed outreach process. So we had faith-based organizations, school districts, uh, city planning, uh, departments and commissioners and city managers and, you know, business groups and 
you know, you name it, um, Samsita group, and we targeted everyone and asked them all sorts of questions about childcare and also do you know of sites that could be developed for childcare and whatnot. So that was phase one. And then in, in those surveys, we were asking about potential sites. And so in this phase two of the study, we focused in on, we started with, um, I'm gonna, um, we identified 44 possible site leads in those surveys. We drilled it down to 19 possible real leads. And then we did further research and evaluation of those sites. And we drilled down to um, seven that we could research. We also didn't have funding to do all 19, but we, so we picked seven of the ones that were the, the most interesting, seemed to have the most potential, and also represented a, a range of situations that we could learn from. So we uh, chose these centers, two and five, or well, two is near Redwood City and um, five is in Redwood City. So sites five, six, and seven, upon further investigation, were uh, eliminated because of various issues um, that ha really had nothing to do with childcare, but like in the Kanata College, they decided they were gonna use the space for something else. And um, so, one of so in all of that analysis these are the these are the findings that basically childcare is facing issues of cost and funding lack of funding building code challenges zoning and permit challenges the licensing and outdoor space challenge it's very hard to find sites that offer the offer they can find the building space but not the uh, adjacent open space they need to meet the licensing requirements um, often there's multiple parties and approvals involved that can just be really difficult to get through the lack of available land and also of course the cost of land in in the county um, school district sites countywide and faith-based organization sites were the strongest pos you know candidate sites um, there was strong interest and high need, of course, but there was also many challenges, just a variety of challenges, including neighborhood opposition is a big one often, which is, is uh, difficult. So um, the next part of this study we did was what I tried to conceive of as a capital improvement plan for childcare. So I'm trying to, uh, translate the need for child care into language that cities and public works departments understand. Capital Improvement Plan, you know, a CIP, CCCC, or CCCIP. Um, so we took, um, we looked at recent child care projects. We looked at their detailed cost estimates, created average square footage costs and outdoor space costs and all of that. And we took our unmet demand uh, in the county and we divided it into these different kinds of uh, facilities that could be provided for childcare. So there's just different portables or new buildings or existing buildings, expanding ex at existing centers and then employer-based centers. And then we came up with average cost per childcare space. So when you weight all of those together, the average is almost 41,000 per childcare space, including outdoor space costs. Um, these are in current dollars. Um, so I thought it would be useful to look at this because that's a big number and kind of everybody's like, wow. Um, you know, you think about at least a 30 year lifespan for that facility. And then, you know, in a 30 year lifespan, you have say four years per child on average of attendance. And then you can serve 7.5 children in that space over 30 years with an average cost per child of 54.29. So much less, you know, when you're really talk, breaking it down like that, it's a little more digestible. Um, so what we looked at in, in depth in this study um, was various financing mechanisms that could be brought to bear to fund this shortfall countywide. And so of course, individual cities and the county itself would could pick any of these or some of these, but um, we did some detailed analysis of like, what would a countywide parcel tax look like? What would a 
a countywide sales tax add-on look like? How much money would that bring in? How many, how much of the need could be met by these mechanisms? Um, developer impact fees are one. Um, I worked on, um, as Kristen mentioned, the South San Francisco child care fee was the first fee um, that really followed uh, AB 1600 or the Mitigation Fee Act. And so really try, tied a nexus into, into the fee. Um, and that fee is still in place. And then employer-based care is another uh, you know, method, um, an important type of care. Grants and foundations. There's the State Child Care Facilities Revolving Fund which provides money to providers, but in the past it hasn't provided enough to actually fund the whole project. And so there's, all, there's been various challenges with that money actually being able to be used. Um, uh, or the fact that um, many providers can't even pay back a loan. I mean, really, they just don't make enough profit. 85% um, on average of a provider's costs or labor costs there's just such a small margin. Community benefit programs, I, I do a lot of work, as I said, in urban economics just in general. And there's lots of different community benefit programs that are, cities are adopting right now and trying to uh, uh, ensure that the community is receiving benefits over and above normal impact fees and whatnot. And so we feel that child care is an excellent type of community benefit that we would encourage developers to provide. Um, and then of course, development agreements are another way because there's no nexus requirement. So in the countywide study, we looked at all of these uh, a little, you know, described them in more detail. Um, the recommendations from the countywide su summer study were um, really to increase advocacy for childcare just across the board. Uh, the issue, I mean, I'm a firm believer that child care is an economic issue. It's a, it's a key part of a healthy economy. It allows families to go to work. It allows employers to reduce costs because they're, you know, they're, their employees are not worried about where their kids are. I mean, there's just so many economic uh, reasons that child care is important. Um, we really wa want the county to look at a countywide funding mechanism, similar to the uh, affordable housing uh, grand nexus study that was done recently for affordable housing. There could be a child care grand nexus study. Um, we also want to really try and target large employers to provide child care and and then also partner with our school districts and faith-based organizations. Definitely, as I mentioned in the beginning, leverage new development. Um, you know, when you put childcare in a large mixed-use project like we just uh, saw tonight, it allows people to use transit. If their childcare is on site, they can run out to that bus stop and catch a bus or to Caltrain or wherever, where if they're having to drive over here to get a space and then drive back the uh, totally different direction. This happens, you know, <laughs> to get to work, you know, it just increases commute and traffic and all of that. So having uh, child care within mixed use projects and also at transit oriented development sites is really, really important. And then just the thing that cities can do the most is just reduce barriers and streamline the permit process and the cost of permit permitting for providers. Again, they don't make much money, and you know what a normal developer could afford in permit fees is just a huge barrier for a child care provider. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, who can talk a little bit more about those recommendations and how they relate to Redwood City, and then I can answer questions. Thank you. So I just pulled out a few of the recommendations that Joanne just reviewed from the countywide study to, to think about which ones are applicable in our community. Um, it may be that with school district space and church spaces, we may be maxed out. Um, in the, the countywide study, the surveys of providers and and uh, other stakeholders, only one church, the Redwood Baptist Church on Euclid was a potential um, for 
um, expanding the current preschool or housing a new preschool there. And that church property had recently been through a very traumatic uh, process, as you remember, with the private school that was proposed to go in there. Um, so leveraging new development is another thing to look at, impact fees or um, the partnership Redwood City um, development agreements. Um, the idea of creating an identified child care facilities fund um, so that developers and others recognize that there is some infrastructure that needs to be funded. Um, we do have a small amount of money that was contributed many years ago from a couple of different uh, projects that has not been used, uh, may go to the Bradford site, um, and another um, amount of money coming in from another project. Um, so that might be something to pursue. Then evaluating other funding me mechanisms like taxes, working with large employers. Um, currently in Redwood City, the, the employer-sponsored child care centers are the county employee center on the county campus, um, electronic arts in, in Redwood Shores, um, and then Provident Credit Union provides a, a small space in the ground floor um, that's not just for their employees, but for any of the community. Um, Oracle uh, contributes to the Shores Child Care Center that the city was a city project with Max Keach as the developer many, many years ago. We loaned uh, him the money and leased him the land to build the Shores Child Care Center there. Um, so that's the extent of the employer involvement that we have currently. And then reducing barriers, looking at uh, the zoning and where child care centers can locate with the restrictions on industrial and um, all the um, air quality issues near Woodside Road and 101 and so on. Um, and then looking in residential areas where uh, people don't want child care to be located, it makes it nearly impossible to find any new site. Um, also the permitting process for family child care homes is another thing that we can look at because those are very critical um, parts of our supply. So, um, you know, we're here to just hear any questions you have and gather feedback. And I think the intention is to take our presentation to the city council at a future date, which I don't have any idea when that would be. But, um, but anyways, and then our contact information is there if you want to email us later. So we'll take questions if you have any. Great. Thank you. Any Commissioner Schmidt? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So um, thank you very much for uh, this information. Um, I did have some opportunity a couple of days uh, this past week to uh, to study on it myself and try to do as much research as I could on it because it was, this was a first for me uh -huh. uh, as a planning commissioner. And, uh, and literally the first impression or the first thought uh, that came uh, to my mind after reading all that, that this is a pretty tough nut to crack um <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it is really because it's it's kind of a catch-22 it's very expensive um uh, you know look just looking at these numbers um and i'm thinking oh my god maybe i should open up a child care center and but you know I, you, you know and, or maybe open it up at chris beth's house i don't know yeah <laughs> but but it's interesting because um it's not only very expensive you could say that trying to remove some of the red tape, but you know, but then you have to be careful with that because you are caring for children, and you want to make sure that the people that are caring for their children and right. uh, you know are are great people, plus that that they have 
great facilities to care for your children. Um, you know, I I was thinking about the parcel tax, but you know, would I as a community member go for that? You know, we pay parcel tax for the schools, but childcare, where does that, you know, where does that fit in, you know, into the grand scheme of things? Is it, you know, it's, you don't really look at that as a, like a high school or an elementary school type of deal. So I, you know, I, I personally would have a tough time getting convinced paying a tax to what, do that, to do that. What if it was only $50 a year? I mean, well, no, no, I'm just saying in general, but I, I think I just looking at it as just on the paper itself, it could be, it could be yeah. 25. It doesn't matter. Right. Just you're paying an additional tax on top of, on top of what you're paying for schools. We call it so I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to think out loud of what oh, really, yeah. no. what are really the answers in regards to trying to reduce the gap on that. And I, to be honest, I found it very difficult to come up with answers on how to do that. Um, um, we are a growing community. I think your numbers are very conservative when you say 3%. I think it's going to be, I think it's a lot more than that. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more people coming into the city in regards, you know, especially in employment opportunities. Um, and there's not a lot of land, you mm -hmm. know, uh, your suggested, uh, areas that you were talking about here, all great suggestions. Um, and, but again, what are the chances of those coming, coming to fruition? And, uh, and then you got homes, uh, people opening up their, uh, their homes as a daycare center. And then you, you know, you've got people next door neighbors who would not want that. Uh, again, cost, it's very expensive. So, I really have a tough time uh, trying to find an answer uh, or, you know, I'm just trying to figure this all out. So, yeah. So I would say there is no easy answer and it is one of those childcare is one of those things that has fallen through the cracks in terms of our civic and social planning and, you know, land use planning, state funding, all of it. It's, it's very fragmented. There's multiple people involved, multiple agencies involved, and it's very complex. It's actually the most complex work I do of all the work because people, and then people have this idea that, oh, well, childcare is just childcare. It's, you know, it's <laughs> like taking care of kids. How, you know, what's so difficult about that? But it's the most difficult analysis that I do to take into all the factors. But that doesn't mean it's not solvable. I really firmly believe that it's solvable. When, the, when we put our minds to an issue, we can come up with innovative ideas and solve it. But there's, so there needs to be lots of different ways to solve it and lots of different methods. So, so this study we did at the county was really trying to get people to think like, well, if we can agree it's important, then let's just look at all the other funding mechanisms we use for all the other things that we think are important, right? And so there's also this thing of the bubble up theory for every dollar you spend in early care and education, you save like seven to, you know, 13. $13 later on in a child's life. Um, because of the fact that early care and education makes them more likely to succeed in life. So there's, all these different facets go into it. And I agree with you. Uh, yeah. And, and the other study that, I, the other thing that I found is that, is it 19 or 20 percent of of an individual's income or a family's income goes towards Right. That's childcare? another, another. That's and, huge. And, and it's actually can be even higher, higher. So, um, yeah, <laughs> we didn't look, we didn't get into that in too much, but in other studies we do. So, and, and even with the, the estimates on the families who are eligible for subsidized care, those numbers, those numbers are based on who is eligible for state subsidized child care, which is, and, and the state uses state median income so that's about 45,000 or 48,000 for a family of four, which works great if you're in Alpine County, but in San Mateo County, yeah. you fall off the scale at that, at that income level, and then you're paying 1,200 
$5 a month for full-time preschool. So. And so in this study, we're also really focused on facilities. We're not so much focused on these other issues, the affordability issues. So that's where it really starts to get complex. You can have spaces in the market that are available, but families can't afford them as well. So, I mean, it really, it really is complex. Yeah. And we're dealing with workforce issues right now where, where programs are having a hard time finding staff, just like you're hearing about the teacher shortage because they can't afford to live here. Well, child care and preschool teachers make significantly less than elementary school teachers. So m many of them qualify for public benefits because they're so low income or their children, the staff's children, qualify for subsidized child care themselves. So that workforce issue is a, a whole issue. The affordability issue, the quality of programs is an issue. And those are, those are bigger county level and state level problems with the system that, that I work with other people in the county on. The facilities issue is what the focus of this is because there is a lot of local control because of land use and development connections and the connection with housing and jobs and transportation. Mr. Hunter. Thanks so much for the um, the presentations and for the the really detailed reports. There's it's been a lot of great information. Like Commissioner Smith, I've Schmidt, I've never, uh, you know, really got involved in this area, so it's uh, it's it's all new and uh, very informative. Um, I have a couple questions to start, and then a, and then a, a few comments. Um, one of my questions is: Can you tell me how does subsidized care work? Um, is it um, government grants to providers? Is it vouchers to parents? Is it just, um, you know, schools and churches providing care at a, at a lower than market rate? So the, the public subsidies either come from Federal Head Start, which is Federal Health and Human Services. And in our county, it goes through one nonprofit agency, IHSD, Institute for Human Social Development. And so those go to centers like the Fair Oaks Head Start Center at St. Anthony's Church, and Head Start has another site on 6th Avenue, a single classroom there. So those are center-based subsidized programs. Then the school district's contract for state preschool is, is the state's version of that. So that is funding that, that comes for low-income families in centers then there's another there's voucher money that comes through the child care coordinating council and other agencies uh, human service agency has some of that money where parents take the they qualify for the subsidy and they can go and use any program in the community so there's different ways the subsidy goes out there may be private scholarships where certain churches or, or schools offer an internal scholarship, so they're not getting money from another agency for that. Yeah, good. So, so pretty much all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, a kind of a, a narrow question here, but um, in the uh, economic study, um, you that was provided to us, um, you use labor force participation rates to estimate the per, um, number of children, you know, uh, the demand. Um, and I, it looked like you used national labor force participation rates. It, no, it's, um, it's from the U.S. Census, but it's based on local data. Okay, okay, because yeah, I would yeah. think that the it, per participation the, rate is higher here than other lower cost areas. Yeah, it is. Okay. It is definitely. You see much higher rates. But and then for the preschool. And then for the estimate. and then in this preschool an estimate we assume just a straight 80% of all 3 and 4 year olds would need preschool as a as an assumption that we are trying to uh, consistent with the big lift at effort to really increase child the child's readiness for kindergarten 
So we're really targeting getting kids into preschool in this study. In the countywide study, they have a preschool for all sort of focus, and we're using 100% of three and four year olds in that study. So that's one reason that the numbers, the demand numbers for Redwood City in the countywide study are higher than in the city study. So we're using a more conservative number in this, in this city study for preschool okay. in particular. Okay, um, I have a, a, few, a, few, a couple comments here of feedback for the uh, commission um, or for the council, I guess. Um, for, first two concerning the funding, um, I strongly um, support the idea of a nexus study, hopefully a county nexus study because it's a regional issue um, uh, and uh, leading toward impact fees. Um, you know, unlike some of the other things, I don't, an impact fee really isn't a tax. It's basically a uh, social cost that is incurred because uh, something is developed and uh, this is just a way to collect that cost um, from the, you know, people developing the property. So strongly encourage the Nexus study, just like we've had for affordable housing and parks and, and transportation. Um, and the idea about uh, loosening up zoning, um, I very much support also. Um, I, it's actually in in, um, in the general plan about um, streamlining and simplifying zoning um, for for childcare centers, um, and I think of it sort of uh, in the same uh, basket as the um, accessory dwelling units um, that we just uh, um, liberalized. I mean, the, the state the state required us to, to change the uh, zoning on that. Um, but it was um, what we ended up doing, you know, under the state mandate. Really, was uh, to um, pa pass pass rules that if you meet certain requirements, you're basically entitled to build a child or an accessory dwelling unit, or in this case, a childcare center by right. Um, so you obviously would need to have stringent um, standards for um, you know background checks and safety and um, in environmental hazards um, but if that's the case maybe that would in ease the ability to uh, put um, family child care centers into neighborhoods um, the last thing is um, and Stephen do you have would you be able to bring up uh, one of the pages from the report um, or, or I can just mention it no oh. okay um, yeah, so in, in in table four of the report um, it's existing childcare demand and supply currently in 2015. And so the existing, the total existing shortage, which you mentioned was 1,100 um, right. demand exceeding supply. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really interesting that in the demand for subsidized care, it's actually more, it's more that it accounts for more than the total. The demand for subsidized care, that is a shortage of 1,700. So what that tell what that says is that there's a surplus somehow in non-subsidized care. Um, so what that tells me one is maybe um, some some of this could be resolved by a reallocation of resource. I mean maybe there's vacancies in some areas of the city um, that have non-subsidized care. Um, you know but maybe maybe wealthier can't areas. Them. Yeah, there's right, right, there, but yeah. but there there may be if if it's not simply a matter of not enough space, maybe some of it is could be solved by reallocating some of the resources. You know, obviously you have to provide the financial incentives. Right. Um, the other thing it tells me is that um, it indicates that the shortages are um, concentrated in lower income neighborhoods. Um, so one, I I, I was going to ask if there's other evidence to support that, um, and then the other. The last thing I'd want to say is that if that's the case, then I would, it's more important to find new facilities in those neighborhoods. So for instance, now I, I guess Kenyatta College is off the table, but for instance, you were, um, you mentioned Kenyatta College and St. Anthony's, even though that's in Menlo Park, it's right next to Garfield School, I think. Um, seems to me that focusing on adding capacity to St. Anthony's would be a lot more important than adding it to Kenyatta College because of the neighborhood that St. Anthony's is in. Yeah, so let me let me mention a couple things. So 
I did a countywide needs assessment in Contra Costa County, which has some very, has like 21 cities like, like San Mateo County, but a much bigger geographic county and has some cities that are very low income like Richmond and whatnot, some really high income cities like Danville, Lafayette. And so in that, in that study, we saw surpluses of spaces in the wealthier communities and shortages in the lower income communities because providers were not willing or wanted, didn't want to go into those communities because families can't afford as much. And so they were targeting the wealthier communities. So that was one interesting thing. Another interesting, just jumping around your comments, but another project that I work on right now is in San, San Mateo, um, Santa Monica, the city of Santa Monica did a development agreement with a hospital there, St. Providence and um or providence st john's in um like 20 years ago and required them to provide child care for their workers and part for the community and as part of that they required 25 percent of the spaces to be subsidized for the community so there's all sorts of interesting you know right now i'm working on phase two of that development agreement and they're expanding and so we're looking at the need for child care there so you know, in development agreements, you can um, uh, negotiate all sorts of interesting requirements. Um, and then in the South San Francisco study, where we did the impact fee, we said if you, we suggested that the city adopt a policy that if if a project was to receive funds from the impact the child care impact fee fund, that they would have to provide ten percent of their spaces uh, at a below market level price price level so you can get creative once you have a facilities fund with some money in it you can get creative on putting some conditions on how it's used and so what i've always really envisioned is that child, these child care fee funds and everything and the approach to it we can mirror what's happening with affordable housing and learn from affordable housing and replicate that and at dinner we were talking about even having a child care develop a community development development organization just like affordable housing develop community development organization like midpen to can go out and leverage dollars and get grants and put these things together because often it's not you need you don't need to necessarily fund a hundred percent of this project you need some gap financing you know so some of these providers can bring something to the table but they can't bring 100 percent. so that was all over the place but those are the things that popped up thank you madam chair um i just had a question for staff i don't know if we know this how many other cities do we know and maybe in the bay area or peninsula even have a city-funded child care coordinator anyone do, does anyone know that is this the, one yeah. The Bay Area, yeah. I, mean, I think I'm, you guys are it. San yeah, so, San, so well, I, San Francisco. I, I knew the answer. I, I mean, I knew the answer. I was and then answer. Santa Monica, Santa Monica also. So, so I, I, know. you know, I just maybe I'll just start my comments by saying, you know, really applauding the council and staff, city manager for supporting the fact that we have this That's position because right. I, I, I did not realize just how big of an issue this really is. I mean, I'm, I have three kids. I one of them's in childcare, and I kind of think. Oh, child care, you know, but it, it was, it was, but starting to put some real data behind it, I think was very powerful. So I appreciate it and appreciate um, you as well as, as, as serving this important need to our community. Um, I had a couple questions and maybe even a, a, a suggestion or two. Um, I'm curious, what, we talked a lot about permitting and kind of this is like the single biggest kind of maybe impact area that that could that a city could affect in this area what are one of the, what are one or two kind of big um obstacles that prevent besides the, from a permitting perspective the fees okay the so fees it, and is it is it it's pretty significant literally in the city? there they can be really significant and it's significant with in the term, city or with the county because i understand no, those with, like, like state city licenses. building permit fees and okay. various fees and then also just just even for providers, say a provider wants to expand, they're they're working seven a.m. to six p.m. You know, having expanded counter hours one night a week, even for for you know for them to take off work, they have to find somebody else to come in and watch the kids to come down and pull a permit, or having flexible hours, or 
You know, I mean, there's just all sorts of. Seems it sounds like a, a lot of little. A lot of little fruit. thing, yeah, yeah low hanging fruit. But um, the fees are actually can be really significant for them because they just don't have the capital. Okay. And then the time. So there was one comment letter submitted in, to, on this issue, I think, from um, what's her name? Heather, Heather, Hopkins. Heather Hopkins, and she did a great chart that talked about her process and it took a year and a half you know and she had bought this property and had to hold it for a year and a half before she could even open her business so again those kind the the time it takes to get processed to is 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 a real barrier um in in the data you you suggested that kind of the best opportunities for for child care sites are both churches and schools um uh, I apologize if I missed this. Is do we have data to show what percentage of schools and churches in particular um, have a child care or preschool program in general? We, and if we don't, do you have a guess of what it might be in Redwood City? We do, and I just don't know it off the top okay. of my head. I'd have to drill down into the detailed okay. provider data by by name and okay. We so, could we could get that for you, but I don't. So know. not I I don't have it from the the percent of churches that have it i years ago i counted the number of centers and where they were and about 45 percent were in school spaces and about 45 percent in church spaces and the rest in like our community centers and right. a couple of random commercial the reason programs. why i kind of throw that out there is for some ideas on how we might tackle this problem um it makes sense why churches would I'm going to call out churches in particular, um, would, would make sense besides their own kind of faith-based mission that they're trying to fulfill. Um, they own the property. It's Besides labor, it's going to be the second biggest cost is insurance and rent, and they presumably own the property, and they could probably in, you know, have a small increase in insurance. And they're not rent, using right? it during the week. Right, and they're not doing it <laughs> midweek, right? Um, right. Uh, and, so. uh, and I wonder if... if um, and it's some kind of a, almost like a roadshow, if you will, of here's what the economic benefit could be, right? And and it could fulfill your particular organization's mission, you know, and, and make it really simple and easy for these organizations or, you know, faith-based organizations to consider this as an alternative. Because I know a lot of them are looking for ways of create funding, right? And, and fulfill their particular mission. So that was why I kind of went down that track and make it almost like a, like, I got a brochure for you with a lot of data, and I got his workshop next week. Come join us, you know. So um, over, the, over the past many years, I have referred several people or organizations looking for a site to the few churches that I know are large enough to accommodate. Um, some of them are, are really too small and could not uh, host even a single classroom, um, but the larger churches, including a couple that many years ago hosted um, a child care program. There, there are a couple of those, but they have not been responsive. So if there is some other strategy for someone else to ask who has better It, it was just an idea, and, and, and it could be— It's definitely mess- worth, yeah. worth pursuing. Yeah. Um, and and there are some churches who really depend on the rent that they get from the child care program to keep themselves going. Um, and I think you made a good point there is that the message might be not the issue. It could be the messenger. I know a lot of churches are worried about church and state and, you know, and whatnot. But but it was just something that, that popped in my mind. And I had another um, two other ideas. One, when you were presenting, I... I I had this question that came into my mind, and I don't know if, if there's any research on this. Is 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 there any relationship between you know a gap in childcare or or lack there of a, you know or a, a good supply and kind of women in the workforce? Um, I, the hypothesis being right that if you can't find affordable, good, high quality childcare, then you know it. Um, you know, most mothers would feel like incumbent to have to stay home or take work, reduce work hours. Is, is there any research that you know of that sort of creates that connection? Because I think it's a very powerful, assuming if the hypothesis is correct, that's a very powerful piece of information. Yeah, I mean, 
I think that I think there is a relationship. I think the labor force participation. Oh yeah, sorry. I think there is a relationship for sure. Um, I think it's also. I'm hearing now that that fathers are staying home as well because yep. the mother. Has I don't mean a to call job. it moms I mean, in general, but it's just. But yeah, parent. You know, one parent's having to stay home, or their one parent decides to take a swing shift job, mm -hmm. and then the uh, you know so they're home during the day and they never see each other. Um, but I think the labor force participation rates we see for children under six are much lower than over six. So mm. once children go back to school, I mean, we assume that one, they may can't afford care. They don't make enough money to afford care. So they decide to stay out of the labor force because it's cheaper. If you have two or three kids in preschool and infant care and, you know, you need a healthy so my, salary. My, so my, my suggestion is, is maybe in in um, if and when this goes to the city council or others, you're presenting it. I think that yeah, that but, would definitely communicate to certain populations, and I know it would communicate to me very strongly on this need. So it's just a, a right. suggestion yeah. around advocacy and education. Yeah. Um, and then sorry to take over. One last idea was, um, I know that my office, my, my company has an office in in Detroit. We just move offices, and one of the biggest contentious items we had in that office move was we were moving from an office that had on-site childcare <laughs> to, a, to an office that did not, right? Right, And yet we only had 5% of the population or 10% of, of our employee population used it. It was a big issue, right? Oh, um, and so I, I wonder if, you know, part of development agreements or, you know, that we, you know, an idea could be to create requirements for commercial properties over a certain size to require a certain percentage of square footage to this subsidized or unsubsidized, um, as a as another way of bridging that gap, um, so I was really shocked by the numbers of large employer participants that I just heard tonight. I, I would have thought it was much larger given some of the big organizations we have and a lot of office space. And the fact I think it all fit in one hand kind of shocked me. So, yeah, I think manager. in the county study there was twelve or thirteen employer providers in the county that we could identify. Yeah. So. You can, Commissioner Kevo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have some questions, and sorry after all these comments, <laughs> hopefully there won't be they won't be too hard. Um, the study that you did was Redwood City proper, right? Just Redwood City was not in, unincorporated. Is that correct? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Our... Okay. Th th those were the numbers that I saw. Yeah. On, yeah I'm okay. Sure I just wanted true. to make sure. Um, and then I. I Thank you for um, explaining how the South San Francisco child care fee, that was one of the questions that I had, as well as the barriers to the family child care with regards to the fees. Um, is there a, any way to like, if, if the, some of the barriers were eased a little bit, would there, um, how, much, how much more do you think uh, family child care centers would be available? Is there any idea of you know if there were any kind of easements if if it was easier if it was cheaper if if um if it was a little faster I, I don't know how what potential would be there I don't you're know. referring to family child care mm -hmm. homes homes. Yeah. homes yes sorry um well we we think there are about 111 family child care homes it it varies by week as okay. as some open and others close most of them are licensed for up to six or eight children only and that's called small family child care homes and the state preempts local jurisdictions from requiring anything okay. of them okay. if they want to expand to large family child care homes that's when the the cities can re, or county can require uh sort of modified use permit or a ministerial administrative permit that is easier or allow them by right, which I understand City of San Mateo still does. So those are options for, for treatment and Okay. So it's with the expansion that we have the okay, the barriers to ex expand right. the, the child care. Right. For the, right. For the large for the larger ones. More than six, you said? Right, up to 12 or with two optional school-age kids, so up to 14 max. Okay, thank you. 
Um, um, and then let's see what other questions. Um, I guess those were the only questions. Um, I do want to, um, you know, I, you know, because there's such a big need and there's such a significant shortage. I keep thinking about, you know, my, my youngest is going to be 18 this Sunday. And if I had to, you know, if I was having a baby now, I probably would be very scared of being on one income household. So, um, you know, I do see a big need for, um, for finding a way to, um, you know, maybe have this developer impact fee or, employer-based care, I'm looking at the community benefits uh, programs, those three options, to find a way to encourage tenants, employers, um, to create, like I said before, to create some kind of, um, or to create or fund um, an affordable daycare um, for employees, affordable daycare for employees and communities. So that's, to me, that's something that we should that, you know, recommend or take a look at. <laughs> um, so that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know about um, ha taxing or parcel tax. Again, w um, I think Commissioner Schmitz, you know, s um, commented about that, and um, you know, it's it, it is kind of hard to be to, uh, you know, to get that kind of support from from the community on on a parcel. Um, on a tax, um, but I think if uh, developers are coming in and there's all this development th that's happening, you know, why not, why not, um, you know, put that in, ask for that. So, thank you. Great, thank you. Commissioner Bondano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Stephen, are you running the slides? Is that, can we bring up the slide that was the sort of the short list of recommendations specific to Redwood City that Kristen spoke to. And while I do that, Commissioner White kind of beat me to the punch, um, which is to say I wanted to just echo the fact that Redwood City is absolutely unique in the fact that we have a child care coordinator. And so I just wanted to say that I certainly appreciate the fact that the city has one. And Kristen, I appreciate that you are our child care coordinator. You have served the city very well for many years, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And Joanne, thank you for really kind of coming alongside, especially this evening. What a fantastic presentation. Um, and I like, I like this very much here on specific to Redwood City. And just the fact that we've got this list, um, as you know, Commissioner Schmidt pointed out, there's no single silver bullet to solve this problem. Um, in this case, the more bullets means it's that much more complex and many different ways that we have to take a look at this sort of holistically. So, so I appreciate what's, what's in front of this. And Krista, I know like we've chatted over the years, just, you know, ancillary stuff. The fact that the church I attend runs a preschool as well. And so I'm really interested in your first bullet here, which kind of identifies that we kind of almost think we're effectively maxed out on the school districts and the face-based organizations. We've talked about the high barrier to entry for brand new facilities and, and new programs and new facilities, uh, and the fact that we may not only have maybe one church kind of left in town that, you know. Um, so is there, do you have any sense of, is there room for expansion? Is there capacity in any of the existing facilities in this case that maybe aren't, you know, fully optimizing their programs. I think that maybe that's a lower barrier to overcome than to find net new properties, essentially. Well, if there are school classroom spaces, I don't know about those. Um, what I hear is that because of needing to house the charter schools on the campuses mm -hmm. that the the facilities issue is is a problem there so i i don't know any more than that um the one church identified in the survey there is room for expansion there the 
there it's actually space that was used from for about 20 or more years by a different preschool before the church changed hands and and they uh, left um, I'm not sure about others there are a couple that are not certain that they will have their space in a few years and that they're having problems um, there are others that like Sequoia Children's Center across Brewster from Sequoia High School that has expanded into pretty much every possible space, um, including semi sub basement kind of spaces um, where they're using portable sinks and potties because they're so far from the bathrooms down there. So they're working in very difficult conditions and not very nice facilities. Um, but a, a, a dealing with it and, and providing a good quality program in inadequate spaces. Um, I'm not sure about other, other churches' willingness to, to expand. Um, yeah, um, that's helpful. Thanks. I, I, I kind of, I think, I thought I knew the answer too. I would imagine if someone's operating, you know, operating a program, they're probably trying to maximize it, especially preschools, as you mentioned. Preschools are the money maker. It's the it's the higher grade, you know, the the uh, higher ages that affect that. Just the economics aren't as strong, I guess. As, or, or in, well, for infants and toddlers, it's the worst. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Both um, but of you there, again. yeah, there are a couple of programs that aren't run by the church that are just leasing space, and so those are are more fragile because the the church doesn't feel like they're really the host of the program. Good point. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's been very enlightening. So, will you circle back to the Redwood Shores? child care center that and how did that come about i mean that that came about um first when sandpiper school was opening and the school opened with um a child care in our sandpiper community center that was full with a waiting list when the school opened and the parents became organized out there and there were no programs or very few programs for children under five. Mm -hmm. So uh, Redwood Shores Child Care Task Force started and Dick Clare, the council member, was on it and uh, Parks and Recreation staff and Roseanne Faust, who I think was not even yet on planning commission at that point, but uh, Redwood Shores um, resident and parent at the school and was then on the child care partnership council of the county um, so that group searched for sites in redwood shores and had community meetings about the possibility of using park lands out there which was fought heavily by everyone that came out um, there really aren't the church and school spaces that the rest of the city had more typically so there weren't those we looked at the area a small plot behind the fire station even and that was going to be very tricky to fit anything in there and at that point Max Keach was developing his proposal for the hotel site um, at the end of Twin Dolphin and needed to build a bridge to go to be able to use that property and so he um, very smartly asked us uh, if we would lease part of the water tank site so that he could develop that bridge to serve both of the properties and then um, worked with the child care operator um, to do that and at that point 
Oracle jumped in to be able to reserve spaces for their employees in that center that helps the child care operator pay the lease rate. Got it. So okay. we still have some years on the loan. Um, so the city gets money in from that. So it was a great, uh, a number of people coming together thinking outside of the box. <laughs> very, uh, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> so, so clearly that's what we need to do this. I mean, I learned so much from this presentation, so it's something that will clearly be on all of our radar from now on. And I know that the city has just started a, um, assessment of their different properties. So maybe we can look at some of the places that we own that we don't know what else to do with. So we'll see. Great. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. And we do have a couple of speakers cards. Do I technically have to open it to a public hearing? This is not a public hearing item. You can just simply uh, okay. call the speakers up. Okay. Perfect. So I have two speaker cards, and um, I think you both heard the instructions about how we go through speaking. So Tracy Crawford will be followed by Jean Marie Houston. So I'm Tracy Crawford. I'd like to say thank you for all being here. I'd also like to apologize. I'm working on about a 15 hour day right now. <laughs> So I am tired. Um, I am the director and owner of Roots and Wings Montessori School on the one church that's identified here. I am on the property of Redwood Baptist Church. Um, and I would like to add a little bit of an emotional level to all those nice numbers that she gave you. <laughs> okay. Um, this is not just a Redwood City problem. The, the child care shortage is huge. I have families from San Carlos to Mountain View. I can't answer my phone or I would never be able to teach because it rings constantly. I have email constantly. I have an application for a four month old fetus. Okay. That, that's how many applications I get. I'm already full for next year. And, and actually I have applications going three years out. Okay. The demand is constant. Um, Mr. Smith mentioned red tape and security. There, there's two elements to running a preschool. The licensing process for Redwood City is a lot harder than the Department of Social Ser Services. Department of Social Services handles making sure that everyone has fingerprinting clearances, whether teachers are documented, et cetera. That's easier than Redwood City. It really honestly is. Um, Mr. White mentioned taxes and fees. I have an email today that at the next city council meeting, they're talking about raising the fee for family child care from $400 to $1,387 next month. That came in my email today. Okay. I don't know where these numbers are coming from or why they're talking about it, but even in Redwood City, they're talking about raising fees. Okay. Um, as Kristen mentioned, Redwood, Redwood Baptist Church has space. I've done some quick calculations. With work, we could bring that up to about 70 spaces. It's not economics. I've made the case for economics. I don't, I don't want the money. I want Redwood City to own that church. They are not going to open a preschool unless I'm directly involved. But the only way they are going to move forward is if we have direct advocacy and, and advocates from the city commission and the city council. Um, I met with Steve and Aaron, and I don't know which one said this, and you'll have to forgive me. He said that we have to get approval from the neighborhood because they live in Redwood City. That's true, but this is about leadership. This is about shortages. If we have neighbors that come out opposed to preschool, the leadership has to move forward and support the project and lead it forward. This isn't about community doesn't want a neighborhood preschool in their backyard. Too bad at, at this point. If you want a preschool, the city has to come forward to the spaces that are available and say we want to support it. Um, one more comment real quick. Think about the language that you use with preschool. There's a huge difference between daycare, childcare, and preschool. It shows the amount of respect that you're thinking about the teachers for your kids. 
Um, Jean Marie Houston, and that's my last speaker's card. Chair Radcliffe, members of the commission, thank you again very much. Thank you for the second opportunity to address you tonight, and I won't take long. Um, I want to first acknowledge the previous speaker and all of the ch early learning, preschool, child care, infant toddler providers who do this every day. I had that experience many years ago. It's the hardest work I ever did in my life and probably the most rewarding. Um, but it, it is essential and it's such a great service that must be done for children and families and communities to thrive. Um, I'd also like to thank Kristen. She's one of our heroes and I've had the privilege of working with her for, oh gosh, over 25 years. Um, and really she's acknowledged across the country and as a real leader. Um, I'm optimistic about this issue. Um, in part because of what I've heard from all of you this evening. And yes, this is a tough nut to crack. And we have spent decades working at it, and we will continue to. Um, but it takes leadership. It takes people to become aware. And um, how many of you said, this is the first time I heard this? I mean, this is, have we, I was talking to Pam Frisella, who used to be on the Foster City <laughs> Council, and she's, she's on the First Five Commission. And she said, how come we didn't know this before? How come you guys didn't come talk to us? Well, we're talking and we will keep on talking and we thank you for inviting um, that conversation to get bigger. Um, it does take a lot of bullets, so to speak, to address this. It takes a lot of out of the box thinking. I was meeting with the superintendent of schools, the county superintendent this afternoon, and she had these grand ideas, you know, going on with Ravenswood and the Menlo Park City uh, superintendent of schools and thinking about how could we in many ways weave uh, uh, partnerships together to address some of these issues because they're not easy issues. But you have, um, you have a great deal of um, other cities that believe this. The county of San Mateo is firmly in, in Dave Pine, Carol Groom, so many of our supervisors, your county superintendent of schools, and, and our families and early learning providers applaud any, any um, traction and movement in this area. It, it really is part of a, it's a forgotten part of what makes communities thrive. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. So, Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have to add, this is more for staff, and I've got, I've got a little smirk or a little smile on my face here because listening to the first speaker, and we are, here we are doing a study session, um, you know, that we want to try to improve on this, but then I hear, whether it's true or not, that the city's looking at increasing the fee, the fees from $400 to $1,300, and uh, so what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not familiar with the email the speaker referred to, uh, and I'm not in... Um, uh, I'm not in uh, direct participation in the fee study that is coming before the council on May 8th. My sense, though, is that we are not making it more difficult. We're trying not to make it more difficult in terms of fees for child care facilities. We're trying to make it easier. I can't tell you uh, ultimately what the staff recommendation is going to be on fees at, at this very moment, um, but my sense is that we're trying to make it easier, not harder. Thank you. And I also know that um, it's fees all I mean, all, they're looking at all fees because the city has not been increasing fees annually, but yeah, they've just kind of sat on their haunches. Yeah. So I know it's not. It's just listen, on child listen, care, I know, but, but listening to yeah. this and then hearing the four hundred dollars to thirteen hundred dollars exactly. in conjunction with trying to read this, I'm going, what are we doing? <laughs> right hand, left hand. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation, and we will now go on to uh, the rest of matters of commission interest, which I know we have a couple other quick items. Yes, just a couple quick items. First, um, to let the commission know there's been a changing of the guard, so to speak, with the Historic Resources Advisory Committee. Um, uh, the committee uh, appointed Jim Gernand as chair and Linda Marie Roche as vice chair. Uh, and uh, I think former chair Ken Roland Deli happily gave over the gavel uh, after 
perhaps 20 plus years of chair of that committee. Uh, he is expected to be a continuing uh, participatory member of that committee going forward, um, but um, uh, the committee definitely has new leadership up at the top, uh, and they look forward to working with you. Uh, and I think with that, we are looking to uh, schedule our next joint meeting with the HRAC sometime later this spring, perhaps in early, early summer. Uh, second of all, I wanted to uh, just let you know about a really neat opportunity that staff had last week uh, on the invitation of Jeff Birdwell of the Bear Island Aquatic Center to take a tour of Redwood City's waterfront. It's something that uh, Jeff has been doing for many, many years. Uh, we'll take anybody who requests it out on a tour of uh, of the city's waterfront, and uh, he extended that uh, invitation to staff uh, and also the planning commissioners. It was a little tough to schedule because of weather and, and schedules and things like that, but um, staff was able to go out with Jeff, and I just wanted to show you kind of where we went really quickly and some photos. So we started off here at the Barrowland Community Center and then uh, took the boat down Redwood Creek underneath 101, underneath... Um, Gosh, I guess that is out by the uh, shopping center, all the way into town, uh, right up to Bradford, and then came back uh, along Redwood Creek and then headed uh, up um, past uh, Blue Harbor, which is under construction, and then up past the port, uh, over uh, around to the concrete recycling facility, out to West Point Marina, did a U-turn, came back, went through the corkscrews of Bear Island, and then uh, returned back um, along this way up to the Aquatic Center. So Jeff took us out on the little Boston Whaler boat, holds about four or five comfortable, comfortably, um, and we made our way towards towards Bradford and really saw um, the the creek from a different perspective and from staff's perspective it was just really interesting how prior development really turned its back towards the creek uh, and at this point the tide was pretty high uh, the smell wasn't too bad uh, the, the bay mud can get a little fragrant but um, just a really a beautiful kind of urban environment this is our approach uh, as we hit the Main Street Bridge, and we were up close to high tide, but not so high that we couldn't duck under the bridge. Um, and that is uh, the end of the journey up uh, up into the city at uh, at Bradford Street. Uh, but you know, you really got a different perspective. You could see 601 Marshall under construction there on the right, and then the Indigo Project uh, on the left. Uh, and then we made our way back out, um, uh, back into Redwood Creek and past uh, the Stanford uh, rowing facility uh, and their boats there, um, past the Marine uh, Sciences Institute uh, and their research vessel out there, uh, made our way into West Point Harbor and saw Redwood City's fire boat that's, that's launched there. Uh, so you'll recognize Karen Vaughn and Lindy Chan also went with us on, uh, on that. Made our way back around uh, kind of the, the slough and saw the heavy industry that exists right up at the, at the point there. Um, and then made our way into Bear Island itself. And the, the environment just changed dramatically. And you know all of the buildings went away and you saw a lot of the tidelands and marshlands uh, and um, wildlife that is just right in our backyard uh, that is completely open and accessible to anybody with a boat. Uh, or any sort of watercraft. Um, you know, seeing Oracle in the distance, yet uh, seals and their pups in the foreground was just an amazing, uh, unexpected uh, uh, sight for, for us. And I think along our journey, we counted 30 seals and at least four or five pups that were, were going along. Another perspective, you see the concrete recycling area in the back and and then Pacific Shores there in the in the background buildings, um, but the wildlife is is right there. There's one seal that kind of started to come out and check us out a little bit. Redwood Shores and the buildings in the background there, and and the wildlife that's there. So, you know, this is you know there's 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 no fee to get in here. I mean, it's it's just a very often. It's an, just an unseen area of of Redwood City that I know Bayak really tries to promote 
um, access to the water and, and certainly wants to get people out on the water more. Then we returned back to our more urban edge and saw the Blue Harbor uh, project under construction there, a, a different perspective. And then back in through the Inner Harbor area and back at the Bearland Aquatic Center uh, facilities there. So a really neat uh, experience. If you're interested in going, Jeff uh, would jump at the chance of bringing uh, commissioners and, and any other members of the public who, who want to go out and explore that, that area. So we're really, really, really neat. So while I'm, we're on the topic of our shoreline, I did want to let you know that um, you recall that the folks from Sea Change San Mateo County a number of meetings ago uh, uh, told us about the work that they're doing and the production of the sea level rise vulner vulnerability assessment that was recently released at the beginning of April. Uh, and that's available online, but there's a couple of community meetings that are coming up that you can, you and the public can attend to hear more about the report. The first is a community task force meeting. So they have a, a task force made up of community members and other stakeholders that are meeting at the Santa Clara or San Mateo County Health System uh, on April 24th. Uh, and then there's two public workshops. One's going to be held in Burlingame on the 25th in the evening, and the second one's on the coast uh, in, uh, in Half Moon Bay at the Ted Ackoff uh, Community Center. So I want to let you and the public know that um, these workshops are available uh, and open to the public, and the vulnerability report is available on the website. Then finally, uh, it looks like that our May 2nd meeting will be canceled. We don't have any items scheduled for that. Our next meeting would be May 16th, um, and I'm not ready yet to share the exact agenda because um, that's still in flux a bit, but um, certainly it does appear that May 2nd will be canceled. That concludes staff's report. Thank you. Well, and to dovetail into your trip, um, we've heard that the old Arrivederci site has uh, a new lease tenant and it is California Kayak and they will have um, sales and rentals for boats. Oh, so that <clears throat> that will be a great addition to out at the port. <laughs> Other commissioner comments? All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Good evening.